Commissioner Rotkin? Here. Commissioner Pegler? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Peterson? Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Here. Commissioner Montesino? Here. Commissioner Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Here. And uh, Commissioner Silberberger? Yes, Madam Chair, we do have, we did uh, uh, upload a revised agenda um, um, within the, prior to the 72 hour requirement under um, uh, the Brown Act. Um, and that was mainly to uh, uh, communicate that there would be an alternate location for this meeting because uh, Commissioner Alternate Quinn uh, is planned to participate from a remote location, but he's not available yet. We also have handouts for item number nine, handout for item 21, handout for item 24, uh, also a handout for item 35, uh, handout for item 36, and handout for item 37. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, there are three items in closed session today. Sorry getting a bit of a echo there. Um, the commission will be uh, meeting with the recruiter related to the executive director recruitment. There are labor negotiations item, and then there's a matter involving acquisition of property interest. Do we have any public comment on our... Seeing none, do we have any online? Sounds like not. No? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, with that, we will convene to close session uh, and return. Oh, wait, we have uh, two attendees. We have two attendees with their hands up? Uh, okay. I can't see them on my screen, so I'll have to. Uh, Brian Peoples, Brian Peoples, do you have uh, public comment on our closed session items? No, I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, I don't. I'm sorry. I'll wait for oral communications. No problem. At the end of it. Michael Lewis and Jean Brocklebank, do you have comments uh, on our closed session items? No, but I, I have to tell you that we are getting an intermittent signal on uh, Zoom. We can't add the, the audio is not with the image and the image goes out and comes in periodically. Thank you. We will work on that. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, with no public comment on our closed session items, we will convene to closed session and uh, return hopefully shortly. Ecological disaster. And what's really frustrating now is that that trail was built to accommodate a future passenger train, but the requirements, it doesn't even meet the requirements for a train. So you can't even have a train there. So we're asking, you know, who's responsible for this? Who made the requirements when you did the design that doesn't even meet the requirement of a train? Is it staff? Is it this board? I think we, we need somebody to come up and start accepting that you're not building the coastal trail to the requirements that you actually outline. So we need to step back and really take responsibility. This board needs to take responsibility for the failure of building a trail, designing a trail that doesn't even meet your requirements for a train. The setback requirements aren't even there. And we're gonna see more. Thank you for your time. Rebecca, can you hear us? 
Yes, I can. Thank okay. you. Uh, good, good morning, commissioners. Uh, on behalf of the Seacliff Improvement Association, I wish to invite you to stroll to the Aptos Village Green on the morning of August 3rd of this year. Uh, walk with us to Aptos Village from Seacliff to get a street view of the safety challenges pedestrians face walking to Aptos Village. The main goal of the stroll is to increase awareness and accessibility for all non-drivers and specifically students, those employed in the village, transit riders, families, and those with mobility impairments. <clears throat> We're fortunate to be supported this year by local agencies, including your organization, the Community Traffic Safety Coalition, the California Highway Patrol, the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department, Metro Santa Cruz, and the County Office of Community Development and Infrastructure, who will be available to hear from participants and share their efforts to support pedestrian safety. Uh, we will ask participants to audit their return trip and report pedestrian, bike, and road hazards to appropriate agency and share hazard reporting methods with their friends and neighbors. You know, commuters face a very challenging drive as traffic backs up through the Aptos choke point on both sides of Highway 1. And those who opt to use SoCal Drive through Aptos Village add to the congestion of locals just trying to reach village businesses. And each of us who chooses to take our car off the road wants drivers to appreciate this by respecting pedestrians and cyclists who use much less road space than a vehicle. Increased safety measures will help remind them to do so. In handout number nine of your agenda packet is our neighborhood notice we'll be posting throughout Aptos along with this invitation. And if you decide to join us, you can meet Seacliff neighbor and Santa Cruz County Deputy CAO Matt Machado at Marianne's Ice Cream to begin your <laughs> stroll. Please RSVP to our email address, which is on our invitation, so we can provide you with more details. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, seeing no other comments, we will move on now to our consent agenda. Our consent items are considered in one motion, unless any member of the commission uh, would like to seek clarification, raise questions, remove any item from consent. Seeing none, do we have any public comment on our consent agenda? Seeing none in the room. Second. And none online. We have a motion uh, from Commissioner Rodkin and a second from Commissioner Brown. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Do we have someone online? We, we do not. But okay. yeah, we, we, this meeting is, sorry, Louise, th th this meeting is noticed as, as with the possibility of a remote location. So we do and need, so to, we do do need to do a roll call vote. Okay. Please. All right. Thank you. Uh, we will do a roll call vote then. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner Rodkin? Aye. Commissioner Pegler? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner uh, Gittleson? Aye. Commissioner Andy Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? Aye. That is everyone. Did you? Yeah. Commissioner Quinn? He's not on yet. Okay. All right. That's unanimous. Carries unanimously. Great. Thank you. We'll go now to our regular agenda. Uh, item 32 is commissioner reports. Do we have any reports from our commissioners today? I'll start at this end. Seeing none. Seeing none on this end either. All right, then. We'll move on to our director's report. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, we were asked to provide an update on the mobile home encroachments, encroachments on the Santa Cruz branch line rail, uh, branch rail line right away. As a reminder, we completed a property boundary survey and discovered a, uh, discovered a number of encroachments, including encroachments between the intersections of the branch line with Thompson Avenue and 38th Avenue. These encroachments include fencing, mobile homes, and other structures. These encroachments are unauthorized, 
We're working with our real property consultant, Associated Rightway Services, to develop a list of options for addressing these encroachments. On April 10th, our real property consultant entered into a contract with a firm specializing in land use planning and development with, with specific experience working with mobile home parks. The consultant will research and investigate the existing conditions and encroachments in various scenarios involving moving mo mobile homes out of the branch line right of way, including potential changes to utility locations that may be required if a mobile home is relocated. This analysis will also include the overall site layout of the mobile home parks to determine if access roads could be refigured and, the con and consultation with the California Department of Housing and Community Development. To date, the consultant has completed a field visit to review the existing conditions, met with the site manager at Castle Estate Mobile Homes Park, started coordination with mobile home moving companies to discuss options for removing mobile home encroachments, and initiated consultation with the California Department of Housing and Community Development. We plan on returning to the Commission for consideration of potential options for addressing the encroachments at the August or September meeting. I'd also like to provide a brief update on rail trail segments 10 and 11. The county submitted an allocation request and an extension request for the June 27th California Transportation Commission meeting. Unfortunately, the project uh, is waiting for Caltrans as the NEPA lead to wrap up their portion of the federal environmental review, which is required for allocation. Therefore, the county will be requesting a 20-month time extension for the project at the June CTC meeting. County ex staff expects to be able to request an allocation for the plan specifications and estimate and right-of-way phases at the October CTC meeting. Uh, and we have a number, number of public outreach events that I'd like to make everyone aware of. Um, the Climate Adaptation Vulnerability Assessment and Priorities Report Project Team has completed their initial analysis of the future likelihood of Santa Cruz County experiencing climate change accelerated hazards such as wildfires and extreme storms. Using the project framework approved by the Commission in February, they have also estimated the consequences of damage to the branch rail line and to county transportation infrastructure. Partnering with county staff, we'll be hosting two community workshops where, public, where the public can view and provide input on the climate hazard modeling results and draft prioritization. Uh, the South County workshop will take place at the Henry Mello Center in Watsonville on Tuesday, June 11th at six o'clock. The North County workshop will take place at the Felton Community Hall on Wednesday, June 12th, that's also at six o'clock. Team members fluent in Spanish will be available for translation services at both workshops. Those unable to attend the workshops can provide input on our website. We'll also be hosting two community open houses to, to, solicit, to solicit the public's feedback on the next phase of development for the zero emission passenger rail and tail pro trail project. Uh, this project is analyzing new high capacity passenger rail service and stations on approximately, approximately 22 miles of the Santa Cruz rail branch line from the city of Santa Cruz to Pajaro, as well as 12 miles of coast rail trail from Rio Del Mar Boulevard through the communities of La Selva Beach and the city of Watsonville and the Capitola Trestle. Community members are invited to attend the, up, the upcoming and in-person virtual open houses to learn about the proposed rail transit vehicle types and the initial conceptual alignment and share their input. In-person open houses are at the, will be at the Civic Plaza Community Room in Watsonville on Monday, June 24th at 6 p.m. and at the Live Oak Grange in Santa Cruz on Tuesday, June 25th at 6 p.m. For those unable to attend in-person open houses, a virtual open house will be online from uh, today through July 18th. We'd also like to invite the community to come out to celebrate the groundbreaking of the North Coast Rail Trail on Thursday, June 20th at noon at Wilder Ranch State Park. Uh, this project is a 7.5 mile multi-use bike and pedestrian trail extending along the railroad corridor from Wilder Ranch State Park in the south to Davenport in the north. It compromises the majority 
of Coast Rail Trail Segment 5. Phases 1 and 2 of the project are starting construction this month and include new paved parking lots and restrooms in Davenport and at Panther Yellow Bank Beach, improved access to park the parking lot at Bonnie Doom Beach, and a pedestrian crossing of Highway 1 in Davenport. Construction of these initial phases is estimated to be completed in March 2026. Phase 3 of the project includes construction of the Katoni Coast Dairies Highway 1 overpass that connects to the Coast Rail Trail on the coastal site of Highway 1. This phase is scheduled to complete environmental review in late 2024 and design in 2025 and be begin construction in 2027. As a brief legislative update, on May 29th, legislative leaders in the Assembly and Senate announced a joint legislative budget plan. The plan aims to balance the state budget through 2025-26, and in doing so, the legislature proposes several reductions than differ from those proposed by the administration. Uh, most relevant to us, the legislature has proposed not to have the cuts that were proposed by the administration to the active transportation program and instead fund those, uh, what, those funds that were being from the general fund, $600 million, to instead fund them from the state highway account. Um, the legislature's proposal would also cut, uh, reject a, a proposed cut of $148 million to the competitive transit and intercereal capital program. The legislature has until June 15th to approve the budget, after which the governor has until June 30th to sign and uh, line item veto items. Additionally, some ele elements of the budget uh, are finalized through tra trailer bills, which come in later in the summer. There are a couple of staff uh, announcements I'd like to share. We have a couple new people on our team. We're pleased to welcome Leo Farrell, who started on May 7th as a temporary employee in the fiscal department, and Janine Ramirez, who started on May 28th as an engineering intern. Leo has an associate's degree in accounting and general arts and is currently pursuing an associate's degree in business administration. He previously worked as an accounting clerk for the County of Santa Cruz in the Tax Collect Collectors and Treasury Department, as well as worked in the private sector at an accounting firm. Janine is currently a student at Cabrillo College, pursuing her associate's degree in engineering. She plans to attend San Jose State to obtain her bachelor's degree in civil engineering with a focus on transportation. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Amy and Shannon and Luis for stepping up and helping the logistics and coordination of today's meeting. Uh, Yesenia is on a well-deserved vacation. Krista uh, had to unexpectedly take some time off and the three of them stepped in to help make sure everything runs as smoothly as possible. So thank you. That concludes my report. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from commissioners? Yeah, just a, an update. Uh, how many mobile homes or pieces of property are we talking about on the right of way? That were... Good morning, Commissioners Grace Blakesley. 11 mobile homes um, are encroaching. There's also a number of fencing and um, other kind of sheds and outside units. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? All right, do we have any public comment on this item? Seeing none in chambers, do we have any online? Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, we will move on now to our Caltrans report. It appears my mic is... Oh, I saw it, there you go, okay. yep, you're on. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Dave Silberberger. I'm the Office Chief North for Project Management at Caltrans, and I'm here on behalf of Scott Eads, the District Director. I have just a couple of items this morning. Um, first, um, there'll be overnight lane closures on Highway 17 for some culvert repair, and that will be from June 9th to July 15th from 8 to 5 a.m., 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. Sunday through Thursday. It's located about 1.5 miles north of the city of Scotts Valley near Vine Hill Road. So during the overnight work hours, travelers on southbound Highway 17 will not be able to turn left onto Vine Hill Road. Southbound travelers will instead continue south on Highway 17 to Granite Creek Road off-ramp and then head north to uh, Brantsafort Drive. 
During all construction hours, emergency vehicles will be able to travel through um, the project area. Uh, the second item I have, um, I know that, that the Big Sur area and all the slides are a bit south of us, but I, uh, I wanted to just give you an update on what's going on down there. Um, Highway 1 at Paul's slide now is now expected to open early um, to um, between uh, mid-July, um, between now and mid-July. Highway 1 at Paul's slide closed since January 14th, 2023, so it's been a long, a long endeavor, is now expected to reopen by early to mid-July. The southern closure of Highway 1, currently in place at Lime Kiln State Park, will move north and open direct access to the community of Lucia, um, and the, um, boy, I don't know actually how to pronounce this, Kamadali Her Hermitage and uh, area residents. Except for an 11 mile section where repairs continue, travelers from Cambria, San Simon area are currently able to travel north as far as Lime Kiln State Park. <coughs> travelers from Monterey Carmel area are able to travel as far south as Lime Creek, south of Esalon Institute. The last of the repairs to be completed will be at the Regent slide. Due to challenging conditions associated with the extreme slope at the site, repairs of the Regent slide are now estimated to be completed in late fall. Once this is done, completion of the repairs at the Regent slide will open up Highway 1 to direct travel between Cambria and Carmel. So that was kind of the big thing is, is when can we expect that? Because we do know that travelers um, are looking to to run the entire stretch of the coast from Santa Cruz all the way down to San Luis Obispo. So um, Caltrans is continually trying to do what we can to keep that highway open. So that's it. Thank you. Commissioner, questions or comments? Seeing none, do we have any public comment on this item in the room? Seeing none, do we have any on Zoom? All right. Thank you so much. With that, we will go to item 35, Highway 1, 41st Avenue to Soquel Drive, Auxiliary Lanes and Bus on Shoulder Project Amendment to the Construction Cooperative Agreement with Caltrans for Cost Overruns, Cooperative Agreement with Soquel Creek Water District, and Amendment to the Professional Engineering Services Amendment with Mark Thomas for design services during construction. Thank you, Chair Brown. Sarah Christensen of your staff. And uh, this item has quite a bit of meat to it, so I will um, give a high level and then uh, dive into each one. But the main part of it is the amendment to the cooperative agreement with Caltrans for the construction component of the project, which includes uh, adding $3 million uh, requested by Caltrans for the construction support component repurposing of funds that were uh, previously for a prior segment of Highway 1 that um, were kind of left over that we're wanting to use for this project, and that will go to the construction capital component. And then um, lastly, adding funding from the Soquel Creek Water District, who uh, we've been working with. Uh, we share a property line at the Chanticleer Bridge, and we've been working together on having kind of a consolidated fencing configuration. And so um, they offered to pay for the changes that they were proposing. So in order to accept the funds and use them for the project, we need to add them to the cooperative agreement. Um, secondly, we have a new agreement uh, with the Soquel Creek Water District that allows us to accept the funds for the railing change and a amendment to the uh, professional engineering services agreement uh, for continued design services during construction and programming of additional Measure D highway corridor funds, um, which we request authorization to implement inter-program loans and to amend the fiscal year 24-25 budget accordingly. So the cooperative agreement amendment, um, the request by Caltrans came in and there is an attachment, attachment two, to the staff report, which includes a letter, a memorandum from Caltrans, which outlines the, um, the budgetary situation with the construction support component of the project. So they have um, estimated how much funding they need to complete the project. The project is expected to be complete in 2025. That information is all included in attachment two. 
Um, I'm just going to get to the recommendation because I think I've covered everything. Um, so we request the commission authorize, excuse me, let me get this right. Approve the attached res resolution which authorizes the executive director to um, negotiate and execute an amendment to the cooperative agreement which encompasses um, the additional measure D funds, uh, the SoCal Creek Water District funds, and the earmark, federal earmark funds. Authorize repurposing of the federal earmark funds, uh, authorizing the new agreement with the water district, and authorizing the amendment to the professional services agreement with Mark Thomas in the amount of $134,588. Programming an additional $2,948,063 of Measure D Highway Corridors revenues to next fiscal year and the following fiscal year for the project. Um, that will help pay for the costs overrun by Caltrans. And that's included in the um, attachment to the, sorry, Exhibit D to the staff report. Um, and then authorizing the use of inner program loans, which should be short term if the need arises, uh, to the Measure D Highway Corridors program to manage cash flow and amending the budget accordingly. And that concludes my staff report. Thank you. We'll start with Commissioner questions and comments, uh, and we'll start with Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to read from the Caltrans cost overrun, which was uh, in the remarks here. As implementing agency for construction of the project, Caltrans is responsible for managing, emphasis, the cost of construction, support, and project staffing. Uh, it's become evident that the construction support budget provided to the RTC at the time um, was underestimated. Why is that our problem? Why is, why is the RTC responsible for the fact that Caltrans reviewed this they made their estimates, and now they're coming back to this body and our taxpayers to uh, subsidize their, I'm not going to say mismanagement, but it's, you know, they, they obviously did not do the proper calculations. Why should this body subsidize them? I could take a stab at it, but I also have David Seilerberger from Caltrans. I have the project manager, Madeline Jacobson, and I also have the construction senior, Jorge Ubikawa, here um, to help answer some of the detailed questions if the commission has. Um, but essentially, we um, are the sponsor agency. We have an agreement with the CTC to accept the solutions for congested corridors funds, and um, if we, if the project goes over budget, we can't go back to the CTC to ask for additional congested corridors funds. And that's spelled out in our agreement. Um, and um, we're the project sponsor, so unfortunately it, we're responsible for the cost overruns. Does our executive director, I read somewhere where there's negotiations that uh, happen here. Uh, Talk a little bit about how negotiations go with Caltrans and what, uh, do we have any, um, I mean, do we just have to write out a check for three mil or do you, is there any sort of wiggle room? So there, there's an attempt to, to verify and to go into detail about what the projected uh, costs are gonna be and to see how those are being ascertained and look at, look at the detail and Sarah and, and Madeline and Caltrans have gone into extensive amount of detail of reviewing that. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're on the hook for the cost increase. So we're not in a strong negotiating position. Okay, fair enough. Commissioner Rodkin, did you have a question? I, I just want to know who's responsible for the earmark that we have on this? I'm sorry, for the what? The earmark that we got? The earmark. Um, who's responsible for that. It was a federal earmark that was assigned to the Morrissey SoCal project, and it was left over, and we had requested to the feds to, instead of giving the money back, if we could use it for another project, and they um, accepted that. So there's not an individual Congress member who's a sponsor of this earmark? Oh, goodness. Maybe Sam Farr, Luis, 
or Grace? Far. Okay, I Sam Farr. Yeah. We don't know. I'm sorry. Sam Farr. It is. It, that goes back that far. Yeah. Yes. Um, Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, when we get to the final motion, I'd like to add a uh, send him a thank you. Commissioner Schifrin? Yes, I wanted to follow up on Commissioner Johnson's uh, concern. First to say that cost overruns are, seem to be a way of life on these large construction projects. And as I will remind the commissioners, when we have to face cost overruns on the rail trail, we face major cost, you know, significant cost overruns for the highway projects as well. It's not, this is not the first time this has happened, and it may not be the last time even for this project. Before um, asking about what the specific cost overruns are for, I wanted to just say that this is, I remember having the same problem when the Highway 1 um, Fisher project was done where essentially it's a state highway, so Caltrans uh, is responsible for doing the construction, but actually we're on the hook because we asked for the project. We want to have the, um, we want to see the project done, and we requested the funding from the CTC to cover the state costs. And I think the passage of the original Measure D that allowed us to provide, uh, you know, the local funds really made these projects happen. But it's a it is a weird situation where, on the one hand, it's our project. We're also ultimately responsible for the financing, but we don't really control the construction. And so I want to, you know, what we can do is ask our staff whether in their, um, with, in, in terms of their knowledge and their uh, involvement with Caltrans staff, whether they agree that these cost uh, overruns are necessary and really were unavoidable. Because it's not surprising that once you get out there and you start digging up the ground, you're going to find things that you didn't expect and things can get more complicated than the original plans would uh, indicate. Uh, so the fact that there are cost overruns is certainly nothing new. But I think it is, especially when we're talking about the overruns and the kind of magnitude that seem to be involved here, that we get some, since we're the commission's needing to pay for it, that the commission really gets a more detail about what is the justification for these, the expenditure of the additional money, where do these cost overruns come from? So the question, the main question I got is, are the costs necessary and unavoidable? So the RTC staff has requested additional information from Caltrans. We're still waiting um, for that information in order to substantiate all of the costs to date to the project. Um, we are expecting to get that information hopefully this summer, David. Um, and then just to clarify, this is for the construction support component. So this is not for construction capital. This is for support. What so, does that mean? So capital construction capital is... Um, like a major change that added costs in the field for construction, like additional material, additional labor was needed to change something that was unforeseen in the field. That would be construction capital. Construction support is Caltrans administration of the construction con contract. So they have, uh, you know, staff, they have inspectors, resident engineers on site, um, and the budget got blown. So this gets back to Commissioner Johnson's original question is, why wasn't this anticipated, uh, since it's not really increasing the cost of the actual on-the-ground construction, why, why wasn't the, these costs anticipated in the original contract for the project. And I guess a related question to that is what percentage of the support does this additional cost over one represent? Is it like 2% or is it like 20%? It's, you know, how significant is, is, is this additional requirement? I could have that for you in a second. David, if you want to chime in at any point, you can. 
Yeah, no, um, there's a couple things I want to say is one, we take our job very seriously and um, we do not intend to overspend or, um, and one of the things that we found is that um, initially we actually dropped the ball and we have to own that. We, we should have asked for more. There was a bust in our estimate on the support costs originally. And then once we found that out, which is we told uh, RTC staff about a year ago that we had found the error. And one of the things I wanted to say too is that, um, I mean, I wanted to give kudos to Sarah and then our, our um, project manager, um, Madeline, is that once we knew about the error, um, we initiated, I believe, weekly um, status meetings to make sure that we were tracking the costs. So it wasn't like we just bumbled along and then determined, okay, here's how much more it's gonna cost. It was, hey, let's cut costs wherever possible. So, so first we had the error. Then second, um, Caltrans found it necessary to use consultant staff for inspectors and REs because we've had a difficult time staffing here in Santa Cruz. And that's more expensive. And so that has caused the burn rate to be more than anticipated. However, in an effort, um, Sarah is constantly pushing us, where can we cut costs? Where can we cut costs? Um, we've gone from six consultant staff to two because using Caltrans staff is cheaper. So I just wanted to let you know that there are measures that we're taking to try to cut costs wherever we can. And then additionally, um, the project is a complex project. It, it's right downtown Highway 1, and so there's been quite a few contract change orders, and so that takes staff time. And so in the end, I think the message I want to give to the commissioners is that, one, we take our job very seriously. We don't like to make mistakes, and we did make one. But additionally, we're trying to um, make sure that, that we're keeping costs as tight as we possibly can. Could I follow up, yes. uh, ask a follow-up question? Since Caltrans um, did make a mistake, and I'm not sure how, what the impact of that was, doesn't, does Caltrans have any funding source that they can, that the agency can draw on to correct them, you know, to pay for that, to take the, essentially the responsibility and uh, the burden of the additional cost that, sh that could have been theoretically in the original grant um, and cover those costs rather than making it a burden on the commission? Unfortunately, no. Not that I know of. There is no fund to pull from. Do, do we know what the dollar value of that mistake was? Um, I just looked up the original budget for construction support was about $3.9 million total. And this is a $3 million uh, request. So now the new estimated or the new budget for construction support is $6.9 million, assuming the commission approves the item today, and that's about an 80%. But um, we want to remember, though, is that, is that it, part of it is the estimate we missed, but then a good part of it also is the increased cost of using consultants to do the inspection. Do you know what the breakdown is? I don't know if we have that, the breakdown of what it cost, but we could, we could look into that, of what the difference it would have been between using Caltrans staff and consultant staff. Maybe we can make that as an action item. Any additional comments or questions? Commissioner Koenig? Thank you. So, I mean, I understand we, we don't have a lot of detail today. Um, I mean, do you have any insight into, like, why the fundamental error happened in the first place? I mean, do you guys think it was a half-mile project when it's actually 1.2 miles? Or is, do you think it was, like not as, maybe we were only going to two lanes instead of uh, two with auxiliary lanes? I mean, was there some like fundamental miscalculation or was it just staffing in Santa Cruz? I mean, we understand that's a, always a challenge. It, yeah, and I think, I think that's why I'm, you know, when I talk about it, I'm gonna talk about it in one of the three areas. So one of it was the miss, 
I'll call it, the other one was consultant costs, and then the third one is ongoing CCOs, contract change orders, that require additional staff time that you're not expecting. So I, I believe you're asking about the first one. How did we make the mistake? Generally speaking, Caltrans does what we call a bottoms up estimate. And that means that we have all of our units, all of our divisions, whether it's surveys, construction, environmental, they give us the hours they believe that um, it's gonna take to do the job. And in this case, when we, we've re reviewed um, the error, it, there were a couple of bigger departments that actually, I believe that's correct, bigger departments that had not put in their hours. We should have caught that. Somebody should have said, hey, I think it might have even been surveys. Was it surveys? So surveys, which is, you know, the, the people going out and looking through the, through the instruments and things, they're the ones that set the slope, set the grade and all that during construction. It's a big item. To miss the survey unit that's that one hurts so that's at least one of the ones that was missed okay thank you i mean i appreciate that additional detail um i guess where i'm at with this is i mean given you know a 80 percent increase over the original cost estimates i mean i understand that again like has been said that there's cost overruns i just don't want to get into a situation where uh you know we're approving a significant change here, significantly more costs without the detail, and then you know, maybe opening the door for the same thing to happen again in the future. But if this discussion's been going on for a year, um, I'd feel more comfortable looking at this again at our next meeting in August with that detail uh, before approving it. I'm not sure how much money we have left in, if that's a, con I believe that's a concern, Sarah, is it not? Okay, so, and Madeline might be able to address that. Um, so the problem we have right now is if we do not get the additional funding and we run out, let's say, of support costs, support funding, then we wouldn't be able to pay our staff to actually watch over the, the contractor. Um, and I'm not sure what would happen in that circumstance, but if you end up stopping the work then the contractor can turn around and start claiming right away delays, which means that they're saying we cannot do our work because you're not out there to inspect it. And therefore, we are now going to claim lost, you know, lost work. And it can get very expensive very quickly. So then we would be compounding, essentially we'd be compounding the costs. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Got it. If, yeah, uh, Director Weiss and I just had a little powwow, and um, I I believe that if we were to just approve the repurposed earmark, because that repurposed earmark in the amount of one hundred eighty six thousand five hundred twenty five dollars and forty one cents should be enough to get us to August, and then we could come back with additional information um, about the larger Measure D amount. Would that satisfy? I mean, I would feel more comfortable with that. I mean, I think as was pointed out, the issue is we have, uh, you know, Caltrans staff and then, con uh, you know, additional contractors. And I think that's where it can start to get a little bit opaque um, and uh, where I would just feel more comfortable having that additional level of detail and accountability before uh, approving this, you know, larger significant uh, change in costs. You know, I, I might actually ask Madeline if she would, come to the mic because I'm I just want to make it clear that I'm I am somewhat concerned about cutting it too close and then if we end up and then we would have to wait for the the Commission to meet again and what if there's a month now of delay between when we have enough money that would be of concern we don't meet in July either so so, so, Madeline, I don't know how much we have left and what our burn rate is, or if, I know you may have to estimate. Hi, good morning, commissioners. I'm Madeline Jacobson, project manager at Caltrans for this project. And I don't have internet connection, but I wanted to add one thing. One additional change of doing it in two parts is we would be, we would need to rework our cooperative agreement with the RTC twice then. 
So right now we have a draft agreement with this full change incorporated, and so that would be one additional revision. I'm trying to get my computer to load the internet to give you the exact figure of how much is remaining, but based on the invoices that we're receiving, it, it, it's possible we could make it to August. Um, it is really tricky to manage the timing of when we get invoices from our construction team. And I will try to load my internet real fast. Thanks. All right, uh, Commissioner Schifrin and then Commissioner Peterson. We're going to have to pay the bill, so it's, we'd be kidding ourselves to think we're not. I think I'd be comfortable approving the recommendation and asking for a report at our August meeting that justifies the, you know, the expenditures. Um, I would also want to ask our director a question. Uh, given his long experience with the CTC, whether there's any chance that the commission could go to the C CTC and ask for a special allocation based on the fact that this was an error that is going to reduce the limited local funds by a not insignificant amount due to an error that was not really <coughs> a commission. Uh, I would say there's... Uh, Almost no chance the California Transportation Commission would approve that. No harm in asking. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> Commissioner Peterson? Yeah, thank you. I was just curious if there is an amount of uh, money. I mean, it sounds like 130 ish will get us, you know, possibly almost to the next meeting, and at which point we could receive more information and some of the answers to the questions we've been asking. So is there some amount of money, you know, less than $3 million that would get us across that um, threshold so that we could make sure that we have all the information that we need before allocating the full amount? Based on what we know today, um, the repurposed earmark amount of 186000 should get us to August. Uh, yes, Commissioner Montesino. Yeah, just a question. Are, are, are we not meeting a TPW? Uh, yes, we, we will have a meeting on the 20th. Why can't we put it off till then? So I, I guess the, the question would be, do we have, a, so do we have enough to, go, to defer till the 20th based on what we have now? Um, is that the, my understanding of the question? Yeah. And then can we get the informa additional information by the 20th and analyze it? I, so, sus yep. I suspect not, just because we've made the request um, and we were told um, we would get the information in August time frame. Is that? Well, I know that um, our construction staff has been working on it. Um, Madeline, you might have more of a status on that, but we're, we're actually making uh, faster progress than we were expecting and so um, so my main concern my main concern is that we don't run out that that's where suddenly now we're compounding the error does that make sense so like you run out you stop the contractor and then he comes back and says now you owe me another million because I can't <coughs> do my job so now we're actually not only behind the amount that we're asking for but we're getting farther behind and that that would be my main concern Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So I, I, I'm hearing a few things here. I'm hearing from our executive director that we have very little leverage, and ultimately $3 million is going to be paid. I'm also hearing that if we go short, don't provide the proper amount of funding, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot because it could lead to uh, delays and more problems and added expense. So. You know, the emotional side, I think, of this, I'll speak for myself, of, of the RTC is that we don't think this is fair. Um, in the future, perhaps, we can make adjustments that uh, prevent this, this type of subsidy that is, um, and again, I respect Caltrans and the work that they do. I do know, however, that human nature is if you feel that you have a backup and you're always going to be able to rely on you know, 
the parents coming in and providing you with with money that uh, you you spend. Um, sometimes that doesn't lead to the best type of management, and you you know you make mistakes and other people pay for them. But I'm inclined to kind of you know not go on a fool's errand and say yeah we're going to just you know give you a hundred and some thousand right now, but let's just look at this you know. Um, maturely and saying we're probably going to have to pay the money. Is now a good time to do it with the supporting evidence that um, Commissioner Koenig uh, expects, or do we just do it incrementally and 200,000 now or later? I think my inclination is, even though I think a little bit upset, but at the same time, let's face reality. And if this is, is it, should we just do this now and, and get? Um, supporting evidence after the fact. Commissioner Rotkin. I agree with Randy and Andy's earlier point about this. Um, I think I appreciate Manu raising what he raised. I think I think by now people understand we're pretty upset about this, but but it but you know taking the risk of having this thing fall short is not worth it. I, I without doing that I think we can just say we're very unhappy about this, but I don't think we have a choice. I think we should deal with it now and be done with it. All right. Uh, seeing no. We will get a report back, however, in mm -hmm. August about what exactly we got some detail, but full detail on what exactly happened. Yes, uh, I do have a quick uh, question as well. So it's mentioned in the staff report, and I think this is when you're talking about getting additional information from Caltrans. I think that's what's mentioned in the staff report that uh, you requested backup documentation for staffing and on-call consulting services to date. We don't have the information yet, but then it says, Caltrans costs have not been verified against what is allowed in the cooperative and funding agreements. So when we're talking about what is allowed, are we referring to a dollar amount, an amount of additional contracts or consultants? And so I'm trying to determine what, allow what kind of allowance we're comparing against to determine if that allowance has already been exceeded and if if adding this additional three million will cause it to become exceeded, I'm not quite sure what the allowance is that we're referring to in, in the staff report. So the additional information that we requested was uh, information about Caltrans staff time because sometimes people make mistakes. They do their timesheet and they accidentally charge the wrong project. So maybe that's happening on a grand scale, maybe not. Uh, we don't know. Uh, the other thing is, same thing with consulting services. Um, I've been asking a lot of questions about how the um, Caltrans manages their on-call consultants, and um, we haven't gotten very many answers back. So um, it would, you know, as a public official managing the project, I would want to have a little bit more comfort in knowing that these charges that are um, being uh, requested to go to the RTC um, are actually for people working on our project, um, right. simply put. So just, you know, there's a, a list of allowable things that you can, uh, that Caltrans could bill to the project that fit within construction support. So our intent, once we receive this information, is to uh, review that and make sure that uh, the charges are um, allowed per the co-op. Right. So I guess that's my concern, right, is if we get that information back and we find out that the staff time and consulting services are already in excess of what's allowed in the cooperative and funding agreement, what does it mean if we're about to approve $3 million in additional staff time and consulting if we're already over what's in excess of the agreement? Do we just modify the agreement or are we in some kind of violation of something that could put the project at risk anyways. That's to, to, I think, to Commissioner Koenig's point, is we're expected to make informed decisions. And I do have a concern about us not making an informed decision and just saying, here's the money because we're going to have to do it anyway. But um, so that's kind of the base of my question is, how do we know that we're not funding additional services and staff time in excess if we are already in excess and we don't know? Can I try to answer that? Um, I think one of the things, so essentially what's happening is, is the way I look at it is that, is that Sarah is asking to, for an audit, if you will. We're going to go back and look to see has everything been charged properly. So let's say you do, 
let's say you do approve today and we find that there's $300,000 that should have been charged elsewhere and it's like, okay, well, we put in three million, it should have been 2.7. I believe we could go back and just say, okay, 300,000 of savings, we're gonna amend the cooperative agreement and we're gonna drop it to 2.7, not three. So in other words, you're not, because it's measure money, it's, it can be given or it could be subtracted depending on if, what, the, what the audit shows. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. I'd suggest an, an up to figure would be a way to yeah. think about this. Yeah. All right. No further comments or questions from commissioners? So, uh, Director Weiss. I just want to note one thing. Um, in, our, in our staff report, we reference uh, in the resolution attachment C, which was the amendment to the contract. We did not have time to finalize that in time for the meeting, but of course we'll finalize that and it would be consistent with whatever action you take. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Yes, thank you, Commissioner Rockin, I'm aware. Um, so if we don't have any further uh, question or comments from commissioners, we're going to go ahead and go to public comment now. If there's any public comment in the room, we'll start there. Seeing none, do we have any public comment on Zoom? Yeah, we have two public comments, Jim Helmer and Brian Peoples. And let me get them queued up here. Jim, go ahead. Uh, Good morning. Uh, I find it really unfortunate that we have to use local taxpayer dollars for an 80% overrun on a mistake. And I would have liked to have seen Caltrans come prepared by looking at other alternate funding sources, not only at the uh, District 5 level, but even at a statewide level. <coughs> Having said that, <clears throat> Last week, we had a medical appointment in Aptos, and it took 20 minutes to get from Soquel Drive southbound to 41st Avenue at about 2.30 in the afternoon. And while I was sitting there, um, not moving, I was counting traffic in our two southbound lanes, um, how far they were able to proceed. And uh, comparing that to the southbound 41st Avenue on-ramp, uh, excuse me, yeah, on-ramp southbound 41st. And what I found was the throughput on southbound 41st on-ramp was over twice what the two freeway lanes were able to carry. And I just want to remind the commission, Caltrans, many of your regional partners, uh, transportation agencies and other counties have made very effective use of ramp metering where a red green alternating signal light from four to 12 second cycle length can prevent little gaps in uh, steady flows of oncoming vehicles. And those gaps do tremendous wonders to remove congestion, reduce crashes, um, and actually improve travel times quite a bit. Uh, VTA, your neighboring agency in Santa Clara County, all 13 cities passed a resolution several years ago that every city would approve ramp metering um, on new freeway projects. So I would encourage, if not on a temporary basis, consider on a permanent basis when this project is done, ramp metering on Santa Cruz County on ramp. Thank you, Mr. Helmer. Next we have Brian Peoples. Yeah, hi, this is Brian from Peoples from Trail Now. Um, I want to just point out um, alternate Commissioner Schiffner's comment, and I'm not trying to be negative on you, Andy, here, but your comment that this is the regular course of business, have overruns and delays that should not be communicated by this board. Um, that shouldn't happen. You know, if businesses did this, it w they wouldn't be in business. So the mindset of this board can't have that mindset. You need to communicate that you shall not be doing overruns. And so the way you do that is you, in, in general engineering building, is you look at your system requirements and you detail them very well. So I want to encourage you to step back and not um, communicate that this is the regular course of business because it should not be. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next we have Michael Lewis and Jean Brocklebank. Hi, this is Jean Brocklebank. This has been very instructive to listen to the discussion and the information presented today. I'm uh, particularly impressed with the Caltrans uh, employee, I'm sorry I don't remember your name, the lady in blue at the podium. Um, I th hope that someone on this commission will make an friendly amendment alternative or amendment to the uh, agenda item and suggest that uh, Caltrans be given, let's say $200,000 today, come back in August with the information that has been requested. And I think it's legitimate information. As the chair said, we're supposed to make an informed decision rather than handing out $3 million today on a contract that language isn't even finalized, uh, a $200,000 um, commitment will help Caltrans get to August and bring back information that you need. And at that time, you can consider whether you're going to um, allocate the, the uh, close to $3 million, or maybe by then they'll know it's not even $3 million. I'm going to disagree with Brian about these, you shouldn't ever have cost overruns. Um, when I worked in the construction industry for 18 years, uh, I developed what was called the Brockle Bank Corollary, and that is it always costs more and takes longer. So you just factor that in. But even factoring that in, sometimes it can cost more, even more than that. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We have uh, Portia Raymer. Go ahead. It's okay. So do you think, did you like what I said? So it looks like uh, Portia Raymer, you are next, and Michael Lewis and Jean Brocklebank, if you could mute yourselves. Thank you. What was that? <laughs> the only thing I said was, did you like my can we, can we mute all the thank you? Uh, Portia, can you hear us? And just in case, can we uh, get a reminder if someone is joining by phone, if there's a, what is it, star? Star six. Star six. Hello. There we go. Hello. Hey. Yes, go ahead. I, I didn't. Um... Just respond. Well, can you hear us? Oh, yeah, I'm just letting you know I'm here. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, any further public comment? No further comments. Okay, we will bring it back to the commission for discussion, uh, deliberation, and a vote. Commissioner Rotkin. Move that we approve the staff recommendation, adding a letter thanking Sam Farr for this distant earmark that we got, having used changing the language to up to three million uh, dollars, uh, which will be confirmed by an audit that we'll get back. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to use too technical a term, but a clear review in August of what exactly went wrong and the real numbers that come out here. That's my motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, if I could get clarification on the motion. So the motion being up to $3 million, is that to suggest that the uh, funding authorization is not in excess of what is required to keep the project going until we can confirm that the full $3 million is required? Exactly, but okay. they can spend up to $3 million to not, so the project is installed or broken up into two parts, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Further comments or questions from the commission? Um, uh, yeah, uh, Just a clarification, is there any problem with the motion from Caltrans point of view? <coughs> I'm, I was looking over to uh, a project manager um, who also has a lot of experience in this um, as well. Um, I, I don't see a problem with the, the up to provision. Um, 
I believe that I am correct in that if we did find a savings that we could modify the cooperative agreement. So I, Madeline, is that, would that be your judgment as well? That's consistent with my understanding. And also just the way that our cooperative agreements and billing work is it's, it's as the project progresses. So there wouldn't be anything billed ahead of the work completed. So we're not saying spend three million. So it's, it's reimbursement based. Right, correct. So. We're not spending three million. We're going as we're going along with the project, and then that gives us time to to do a report back to the commissioners. Okay. Commissioner Brown. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment on the question of cost overruns and how we navigate those and the particular uh, elements of, of this case. Um, first, I want to say that um, while we don't expect or want, I guess, want uh, cost overruns to be the regular course of doing business, they are. In fact, in my eight years in public office, I believe one project <laughs> in, across a wide range of agencies and government entities has come in under uh, segment five of the the rail trail project is the only one. So it's sort of, um, you know, I'm kind of responding to Mr. Peoples' uh, comment as well, because I had thought the same thing that Commissioner Schifrin suggested. And so to say that it is expected is not that we accept it, it's just the reality. And that brings me to the point um, up, that came from our Caltrans rep that and we don't know how much of this is related to the miss, um, but some of it is related to cost overruns that are because it is, let, let's just recall, it is difficult to find people to do this work for government in our area. And when we have consultants doing that work, um, or, or Caltrans does, it costs more. So, you know, that's just something that we need to acknowledge. Um, and, and rather than saying, well, this is a big Caltrans error, um, let's make Caltrans try to fix it and we're unhappy. If you want the highway, you want the highway. Um, I don't want the highway, and yet I continue to vote for these, uh, you know, these motions, these recommendations, because that's the deal we made. And so I will vote yes today. It's highway money, um, and you know, I think that we, uh, while we can be disappointed, we ought to be realistic about the, the, the space for, for consulting and constructing these projects. I'll stop there. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson? Thank you. Um, I don't full, feel fully uh, comfortable allocating up to the full amount of uh, $3 million because I feel like we don't have the full amount of information that we need to make an informed decision. And I don't think that I have definitive answers to whether or not we can recoup additional funding based on the results of the audit, or if Caltrans does have additional funding opportunities available. I think both of the answers that we received to those questions were not definitive. They were most likely, we think, and if we had a clear yes or no, I would feel comfortable proceeding. But at this point, especially based on the um, lack of clarity of those two questions, I wouldn't personally feel comfortable going up to the full $3 million, but I would feel comfortable going up to an amount that would not jeopardize the progress of this project. Commissioner Turn. Koenig? Thank you. Um, couldn't we always hold an emergency meeting you know, once we actually got this information and if we were in jeopardy of running out of funds in the account. I mean, it sounds like, you know, we may or may not be able to get to August 1st with the um, $186,000 from the federal earmark being uh, repurposed. Um, and if for some reason we were in jeopardy of falling short of that, we could hold an emergency meeting. Now, I'd probably fall in July, which is not easy, but I think as long as we had a quorum, and obviously we've had extensive discussion on this, and we had the information that's being requested, um, we could be in good shape. Uh, Commissioner Gittleson and then Commissioner Montesino. Um, I will vote yes because uh, I want to see the project proceed, but I have two questions. Caltrans um, works in this county, and they understand that 
we need consultants or we need uh, outside help and that it's difficult to find staff or people within the thing. And so that should be uh, sort of in the contractor bid, so to speak. So that's, uh, I, I think that that should be up um, when the RTC um, allocates funds for this, it should be a knowing bid. That's one thing. And then I also think is, or I have a question, because the cost overruns are almost, are 80, they're over 80% of the original bid, is there a way to have Caltrans be, uh, in short words, fined for being so out of proportion of the original bid? Those are my two questions. Um, so in regards to the first question, um, I, I actually uh, agree with you. This idea that um, knowing that in areas of particular difficulty with staffing, that we do need to do a good job of, of making sure that we add additional funding. Um, and that's one of the things also I wanted to convey to the commission too. Lessons learned. Um, you have two, you know, two other major projects coming down, you know, segments uh, in this corridor, and and we plan to use the lessons learned from from the first segment, and I think that's probably one of them. Is is you know, what is it going to take in terms of consulting? Um, in terms of a fine on Caltrans, I'm not sure I would recommend that against myself, but. Um, um, it's an interesting concept. It, again, we take we take our jobs seriously, and we try not to make mistakes, and we try to you know do projects as efficiently as we can. But unfortunately, um, mistakes do happen. And then the last thing I'll mention is that remember this is three parts. There's three parts to the overage. Is one is is the error originally. Two, it's the cost of doing the consulting. And three, the ongoing contract change orders also are adding to the cost of support. So thank you. Oops. I'm going to go to uh, Commissioner Montesino and then Commissioner Peterson, and then just quickly I'd like to note, after this we are going to arrange a little bit and go to item 37 first because we only have our consultants available until noon, so that's only 20 minutes, so I will ask that we keep our comments brief so that we can get uh, moving forward on to the next item. Yeah, just uh, you know, um, I'm supportive of the, of the measure, you know, um, I trust Caltrans is not, you know, um, uh, the explanation that you relayed and the information that's going to be come forward in the future. I, I, I'll trust that that's, that that's what we're doing and we, we cannot, you know, um, stop this project from moving forward. It's a, a really benefit to, I know, my community. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you. Um, I like to say that I, I trust Caltrans as well, and I think we have a really good working relationship. But I also feel that we have a responsibility as a commission and uh, allocating tax dollars to do our due diligence and make sure that we have all the information that we need to make these informed decisions. And uh, based on that, I would like to propose a friendly amendment to the motion to allocate up to $1 million, which I believe will very clearly um, get us to the point of which we can have additional information that we require. Thank you. I know it's intended friendly, but it's mm -hmm. not. So. It, it's not. It's not accepted as a friendly amendment. Right. You could make an amendment, and we could vote on sure. it. But. Sure. Commissioner Koenig. Sure. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I agree. Trust Caltrans, and, and but verify. And how is it that we've ha been having this discussion for a year, and we show up at this meeting being asked to approve this without the details, without a finalized contract, and without even knowing how much freaking money is in the bank? Uh, I would propose a substitute motion that we. Author, uh, authorized recommended action two, repurposing $186,525 of federal earmark funds to this project for the construction support component. And if we are at risk of running out of funds before the August meeting, that we authorize the chair to call an emergency meeting. I'll second that. Call the question. On can, the can I just, uh, if we call an emergency meeting, would we have to have a majority of the board present? A quorum. Yeah. For a quorum? You would have to have a quorum. Okay, that's going to be I call, I call the question on the substitute motion. Okay. Um, quick clarification for the uh, process here. 
If there's still discussion going on, do we need a vote on the call to question? Yeah. Okay, so I still have a, um, I'd like to ask Commissioner Koenig if, um, based on the concern of not having a quorum for a substitute, or excuse me, an emergency meeting, if you would accept a friendly amendment to your motion to add what Commissioner Peterson said, so instead of calling an emergency meeting, authorizing up to a million instead of three. So we would be authorizing up to a million and the ability to call an emergency meeting? or Sure, yeah, we can add that in there too. Or keep what you had and authorize up to a million in the meantime so that hopefully we won't need an emergency meeting, but it will fill the gap. And it still gives us time to get additional information so we're not authorizing the full three million blindly. Sure. Okay. You seconded that? Yes. Do you approve that? Okay. All right, so we have a call to question. I don't see any further comments or questions at this time, so do I still need a vote on the call to question, or can we just go ahead and start with the substitute motion and vote there, and then? You only need a vote if somebody doesn't want to yeah. vote. You can, you can take action on the substitute motion. I would just note for the commission that your staff recommendation today had other items mm -hmm. as a component part to that, so the motion that you would be acting on right now is really only relevant to the first portion of the resolution, which was the one that authorized the co-op amendment up to $3 million. So after the commission votes on that, then you're, uh, if that passes, you still need to take action on the other portions of the resolution. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so we will start, we start with the substitute motion first, correct? Okay. Substitute motion. All right. Can we have a roll call? Certainly. Oh, wait, hold on. on it sounds like we need clarification. The substitute motion, uh, Commissioner Koenig, correct me if I'm wrong, but that we are repurposing uh, the federal earmark, as mentioned in the staff report, authorizing up to a million dollars uh, and in the additional costs, and the opportunity to call an emergency meeting if needed in the case that that a million dollars and the earmark does not cover the costs between now and the August meeting. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Right. And then we'll come back to a main motion. We will come back to the main motion after the substitute motion, as is. Or yes. go back to the main motion. Correct. This, so you, you would consider yes, the substitute motion. Yes, I will turn to staff to confirm. Okay. You would consider the substitute motion first, mm -hmm. and then there are additional actions should you return to either the original staff recommendation if the substitute motion fails, or you would uh, just pick up the other items that were not uh, accounted for in the substitute motion if the substitute motion passes. Excuse me. Roll call. It's also possible for the maker of the substitute motion to put the whole thing in it as well, so you don't have to do two separate votes, right? Um, you can do that. There are the remaining items. Uh, if the, if the maker of the substitute motion and the second agree to that, you could include the other items that were listed in the resolution. Uh, sure, if that's clear enough to both the commissioners and staff, I'll include the other uh, items which do. I agree. All right. Do we get to have discussion on the substitute motion? I called the question. That's the, really we good. called to question. If we're not prepared to make a vote on the substitute motion, we will need to make a vote on whether or not we are prepared to call to question. Yep. Well, can, to continue this, what I consider becoming a more and more ridiculous discussion, it really I will is. not call for it. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Okay. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner Rotkin. No. Commissioner Pegler. No. Commissioner McPherson. No. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. No. Commissioner Schifrin. No. Commissioner Sandy Brown. No. Commissioner Quinn. Not here. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Uh, and Commissioner Gittleson. No. Fails. The motion fails. All Great, thank you. So now, yes, I'm, just give me a second, Commissioner Rock. Can I appreciate your, your guidance, but I've got it. Um, so now we will go to the original motion. Do we need to repeat the original motion? 
staff recommendation, isn't it? Well, staff stitch recommendation, staff recommendation plus correct? a letter, letter to Sam Farr and up to three million, change the language to up to three million. And you're including the other two, all of the staff recommendation, correct? Yes. Okay. That, that, and staff understands that, recognize you do have a draft of the cooperative agreement, so the cooperative agreement language would also represent that it's up to $3 million for the uh, additional construction cost, exactly. construction support costs. Chair? Yes. Uh, with the expectation that if, uh, if during the audit, um, the full $3 million is, is not what was, it, not fully represented, but there are cost savings that it should come back to the commission. Uh, correct, or as the uh, as the uh, uh, commissioner, um, the representative from Caltrans indicated, they may not actually spend that money because it is a reimbursement basis. Perfect. Well, we're going to get a report. Correct. That's you part of the motion, right? In August. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Madam Chair. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner Rodkin. Aye. Commissioner Pegler. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Montesino. Yes. Commissioner Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Quinn. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Aye. And Commissioner Gittleson. Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. All right, um, so as mentioned, I'm gonna move uh, the agenda around just a little bit. We're gonna jump to item 37 so that we have uh, some information from our consultants before they are no longer available to us today. And I will hand it over. Am I handing it over to staff or I'm going straight to Mr. McLaren? You're handing it over to staff. All righty. <laughs> Thank you, Chair oh. Brown. Hi, sorry, Riley, I didn't see you on my screen. All right. <laughs> that's all right, that's all right. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Thank you, Commissioners, and, and we appreciate that you um, uh, worked with us to get this item uh, moved ahead so that we can get um, the valuable information our, from our consultant. And with that in mind, I'll jump into the presentation. I'm going to sh um, share my screen and want to make sure I'm sharing the right item here. We will share this one. And can you guys see the full screen of the yes. presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great, fantastic. Um, so today we're here to provide the commission and the community with a update on the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. We are holding a, uh, it's recommended that the commission hold a public hearing on the initial conceptual alignment and analysis of conceptual rail transit vehicle types. And I wanted to point out what we're doing today in holding a, I'm recommending holding a public hearing is to one, kick off the engagement period for milestone two of this project, which is the initial conceptual alignment and the analysis of the conceptual rail transit vehicle types. We do have live today, which I'll get into later with support of HTR staff, um, is the online virtual open house, which has the conceptual alignment available for public review and comment that went live today. Um, so that has not been available yet for, for the public to review, but we did have the um, conceptual rail transit vehicle types um, analysis in the staff report, which you have, um, and we will be presenting on, on the, um, the conceptual alignment as well. So I'll go to the next slide here. So just a brief um, refresher, the zero emission passenger rail and trail project uh, is proposing adding passenger rail service on 22 miles of the Santa Cruz branch rail line from Popero to Westside Santa Cruz, and also to add 12 new miles of coastal rail trail being segments 13 through 20 from uh, the Rio de Mar area to Popero, as well as segment two of segment 11, which is the Capitola Trestle Reach. And as a reminder of the project schedule, we are in the project concept report. So the first task, the first phase of this project, we kicked it off in November of 2023, and we're about um, a third of the way through. We're aiming to have the project concept report finished up in early 2025. 
um, and the schedule for the remainder of the project is on the screen here. Uh, the, the project concept report could lead into the environmental documentation phase with project approval being uh, potentially in uh, 20, late 2027 or in 2028. And here's a summary of recent commission actions. Uh, in November, we held a peer public hearing and heard the project's preliminary purpose and need. And then we had a milestone one community outreach on the preliminary purpose and need and, and brought that back to the commission, um, a summary of the, uh, the response from the community engagement. In April, the commission adopted loading guidelines for railroad bridges, repairs, and for replacements. Uh, and then in May, your commission adopted typical design cross sections for the project and also adopted recommended horizontal setback guidelines from the branch rail line right away for new structures. And as I mentioned earlier today, we're kicking off milestone two, the initial conceptual alignment analysis of conceptual rail transit vehicle types. And with that, I will kick it over to Mark to bring us into the, uh, the technical parts of the presentation. Great, thank you, Riley. So as we uh, move into this next phase of uh, opportunity for public comment and conversation about this project, uh, a couple of the things that are really key to our discussion as we continue to refine and define this project are not only the alignment uh, of the rail line as it relates to its relationship to the existing right-of-way and uh, the trail program, but also the type of vehicle uh, that would be used for service within this corridor to meet a passenger need. And so at this time, uh, for this conversation, we have three uh, main types of vehicles that we have identified that we're focused on in terms of conversation. Uh, first of all, looking at traditional uh, locomotive hauled passenger cars, uh, which give us flexibility in terms of the length of a train or the capacity of it in terms of what we add to it um, to provide greater capacity. We're also looking at uh, what we call in the industry multiple units, which is basically a, a train with a cab at either end. And the length of the train is defined by the type of ridership that it needs to accommodate and can be made uh, a length specific to that need. And uh, the third is traditional light rail vehicle with uh, electrification, um, principally overhead catenary to provide the service along that line. Um, we're looking at these and looking for feedback on these vehicle types because each of them offers, uh, offers up unique uh, opportunities as well as challenges in terms of meeting the needs for the service. So for example, uh, the passenger uh, locomotive hauled passenger cars or the multiple unit give us the ability to have interoperability uh, in a freight corridor. And, and that's not just the Santa Cruz branch line, but that's also within the Union Pacific line. Uh, so that if in the future you wanted to extend service beyond Watsonville, you'd have the opportunity to give someone a one seat ride to another destination, such as Gilroy to connect to high speed rail and other services in that region. Um, on the other hand, a traditional light rail vehicle um, is something that is not interoperable uh, with freight on a regular basis in a corridor like that, and also prevents some presents some challenges as it relates to overhead catenary when we think about the things that have occurred the last couple of years, particularly uh, with storms associated with wind damage and that, and what that would mean to an overhead system that would have to be repaired and or replaced um, after an event such as that. So these are the three types uh, of technologies that we're looking at for this conversation. At this time, the three that we're looking at specifically are all three that uh, have experience uh, and have gone through the process of certification with the California Public Utility Commission, which is important for the safe operation of the system. Uh, but again, the real difference is what the they can each offer in terms of interoperability uh, with freight and the connection to a larger system in the future. Um, from that, uh, then, as I mentioned, the other thing that's important that we're going to be talking about in this round of meetings is the initial uh, conceptual alignment. And if I could ask to go to the next slide, thank you. Had to forget I wasn't the one driving the slides. 
Um, so in the uh, upcoming meetings uh, that we're going to be holding, we're going to be talking about the corridor and the work that we've done so far to look at the alignment uh, and offer the public the opportunity to provide input and identify areas of concerns or questions that they have as it relates to uh, that alignment along the length of the line. As we've discussed with you previously, um, our primary objective is to look at fitting uh, the railroad within the existing right-of-way uh, where we have the ability to accommodate both the rail project and the trail project within that line, um, but also looking at how we optimize uh, the operation of the system as it relates to uh, places where we can provide siding tracks and other things so that trains can pass each other as they make that trip back and forth between the east end and the west end of the line. And that's important because uh, the, the more efficient we can make the operation of the system from one end to the other, it reduces the operations cost and also the cost associated with uh, train sets in order to meet the requirements or the conversation of the state rail plan for ultimately having uh, service every 30 minutes between each end of the line. We have uh, at this point gone through and done a first pass. Next slide, please. Okay, we've, we've at this point done a first pass to look at developing the conceptual alignment within the right-of-way, again, with the intent to fit within the existing right-of-way. There are some places where we've identified challenges and we're looking at a number of conceptual solutions to address those constraints. And those constraints range from things related to areas where we have a narrower uh, right-of-way along the corridor and or we have constraints as it relates to existing structures or just the alignment of the railroad within the right-of-way that we need to figure out ways to accommodate again with the intent of optimizing both. And as we do that, uh, one of the options that we've also looked at as we develop conceptual solution is, are there places where, uh, for example, the trail might leave the railroad right-of-way and follow a different uh, path to allow the railroad to be passenger service within that right of way, but still obtaining the or attaining the objectives of both of the projects. And again, these are the types of things that we're going to have available uh, for the community to address and discuss in the public meetings uh, that will be coming up at the end of the month, in addition to uh, the online open house, which is beginning as well. Next slide. So, uh, what you see on your screen right now is actually an interactive map that's a part of the open uh, virtual open house, which actually went live earlier today. Uh, there's a series of these maps that show uh, the conceptual alignment of the rail and trail that you can zoom in on uh, along the length of the corridor, uh, segment by segment. And from the drop down screen that you see there with the various pins, uh, you can identify areas where you have questions, comments uh, that you'd like to post as it relates to those, drop a pin, provide a comment. And at the end of this process, then we have a full record for public conversation of the issues and the questions that were raised as a part of this opportunity to comment on the project. So that's really uh, one of the key things about uh, or the benefits of the virtual process is that people will have the ability to then go look at these maps, provide their comment, and they will become a part of the project record. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Riley to talk about community engagement. Riley? Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we have community engagement for milestone two, as I mentioned before, which is this initial conceptual alignment and the analysis of rail vehicle um, types. We're kicking that off today with this public hearing and presentation. We have Tiffany from HGR Engineering also online, who will be able to provide us a little bit more in information as to the other engagement opportunities that uh, the community and stakeholders and our partners have. So Tiffany. Yeah. Thank you, Riley. And if you wanna to click to the next slide, um, I think Riley and Mark have both already done a great job of speaking to this, um, but really today is just kicking off our community engagement for this milestone two of this project. Um, we are seeking um, community feedback 
both today and throughout uh, June and for the next uh, month and a half about. Um, we're asking for everyone to give comments um, either in person, by email, or on our virtual open house by July 18th. Um, and as you can see here on this slide, the key outreach that we're focusing on is we have launched this virtual open house. Um, it is on Zepert, which is Z-E-P-R-T dot com. Um, the virtual open house has some interactive features like Mark spoke to that you can comment directly onto that um, alignment map. We also have that pros and cons list for the different uh, rail vehicle types and um, have some specific questions. You can provide feedback on uh, community preferences for those um, different options. And then additionally, similarly, we'll be doing two in-person open houses um, on June 24th and 25th in Watsonville and Santa Cruz, respectively. We'll be sharing a lot of the same information as on the virtual open house um, with the benefit that we'll have um, staff, both from our TC staff and our HDR team um, who can answer questions and walk folks through the alignment. Um, and we'll be seeking feedback there as well. Um, in addition to those open house options, we are continuing to meet with our partner agencies, providing briefings, um, speaking at city council meetings um, throughout the next month and a half or so. And our TC staff will also be out at several community events over the next couple of weeks, um, both promoting these virtual open houses as well as um, seeking feedback directly. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Riley. All right, thank you so much, Tiffany. Thank you, Mark, for, for that. Um, I'm gonna briefly wrap up with some of the next steps. The, um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we are in the initial task of the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. We are about a third of the way through as shown on the graphic here. We're entering into the summer a milestone two engagement period. Next up will be the milestone three engagement period. And as Mark mentioned during his um, portion of the presentation, that over the coming months in the, um, the summertime and to early fall, before bringing back the uh, information to the community and the commission, uh, we'll be working on some technical modeling and analyses of the um, different operations of their different vehicles that could operate on the, the service, as well as um, looking at our ridership, doing updated ridership um, numbers, doing some sensitivity analyses to station locations, for instance, where riders could um, get onto the service, making um, so we can have a more informed decision about where those ridership centers are um, to provide service to those locations. So that will inform things like the, uh, the passengers or the passing sightings, the station locations, um, so that we can have a, an operation that um, meets our headway expectations. So we'll come over the summer, we'll be looking at the input that's received from this milestone two period, as well as the, uh, the, the modeling and analyses that we'll be doing over the coming months and then coming back to the commission and to the community with milestone three, the refined conceptual alignment and the station and labor facilities and maintenance facility uh, conceptual locations. So looking forward to that. And then um, in the winter, We'll be coming with the draft project concept report and the preliminary cost estimates, and then wrapping up the project in spring of 2025. And I want to be able to save as much time that we have with uh, the consultants to um, take questions. So I'll move on to that. And that ends our presentation. So I'll stop the sharing. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll start with questions and comments from commissioners. Start at this end. Questions, Commissioner well, Brown? I, um, I don't have a question at the moment, but I did, um, I did want to say that the virtual open house is not open. So as the consultants and staff have been referencing that, if you go to that yeah, site, it's still not open. San so. We were, we're, I just was just on it, and on Commissioner it Peterson's on it right now. Okay, sorry, okay. You had me, had me word there, Sandy. <laughs> it wasn't working for me as of like five minutes ago, sorry. Commissioner, questions, comments? I have a question. 
Yes, Commissioner Gittleson. Uh, two questions. The maps, the detailed maps that you showed us um, in those sessions, are those going to be available to the public or for, will they be on? Yes. Okay, great. Will they be yeah. on the open? We'll, they'll, they'll be available in the in-person open houses. We'll have the printed out maps for people to view. Okay, great. Then that'll have the detailed, like where you say, oh, the stations may be here, that, that one? Correct. Okay, great. Yep. And then um, you may have told me this and I may have missed it, but when, what is the goal of sharing the vehicles now? Um, why is that open to the public a little, a little, just a refresher on that. When are you going to decide and um, the, the things that play into it are, okay, anyway, that's sort of a general question that I just wanted to refresher on and what is the influence of the public with that, so thank you. Yes, uh, Chair Brown, do you want me to take that question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so the purpose of the, the engagement period um, as, a, as a whole in this public hearing, one, to kick off this milestone to bring the information to the commission as well as to the community and the public, and to kick off this, this um, discussion period and conversation. To note, we will be coming back to your commission at a later meeting to summarize what we've heard, particularly from the initial conceptual alignment public outreach. So we will come back to the commission, um, provide you a summary and a presentation on what we heard during milestone two, including um, the alignment and the, the vehicle types. But with respect to why the vehicle types now, um, broad picture, um, Judy, we, the, the current proposal of this project is not to set a vehicle type now. So that's a decision that we can carry forward into future phases of the project. Um, should the commission choose to you know, make a decision or do otherwise, that is something that your commission could elect to do so, but that is not the intent of the project at this time. So what we're doing now with the option for the, or the recommendation for holding a public hearing, including the vehicle types is to allow the public to um, respond to the vehicle type analysis that we've presented today. Um, the various pros and cons that are there in the staff report and in the presentation to provide feedback to your commission and um, express um, their, their opinions and concerns regarding the different vehicles that are being proposed. The proposal at this stage will be to take those three types of vehicles and carry the analysis of the ridership, the operations, um, the other things that um, are contingent upon those vehicles through the summer and early fall months to come back with that refined analysis. So um, we want to hear now the input on those th three vehicle types so that we can have a better informed decision as we do our modeling and analysis over the coming months to come back with that refined analysis. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. <clears throat> yes, thank you. I, I have a little concern about uh, being on the commission and providing input before the community meetings. So, I mean, I don't, um, it seemed reasonable to have a public hearing on, on this to get the introduction to kick off the process, but is it really the expectation that the commission would be providing input today as opposed to providing input after we hear from the uh, community meetings and it comes back to us with um, uh, information about those community, uh, the community input and then provide our input just seems a little bit like putting the cart before the horse, if I'm understanding the staff report correctly. So what is the intention here? I think um, I hear you on that. The, the intention is more to kick off the public hearing, so, or to kick off the public engagement period. So um, I think and, and Mitch, if you want to jump in, um, if I say something incorrectly here, but I think the, the best course of action and recommendation would be to um, have this time be a time of you know questions that the commission may have, um, reserve your input and direction until after the public engagement period is completed. We will come back to your commission with a summary and, and presentation of what we heard. Um, and then if you have any direction that you wanna give at that point, 
it makes sense that that would be uh, the better course of action. I, I think that, from my perspective, that's a correct way of going forward. I, I'm sorry that the staff report didn't sort of frame it that way, because it seemed to be asking us to provide input before really hearing from the public, except for this public hearing. So um, I, I, uh, I think the process you've just outlined is a, is a good process. Thank you. Commissioner Rotkin. Uh, I have two areas of concern. Uh, there's some confusion in the community, I think, and I have this confusion, about the three vehicle types. I think the use of the phrase light rail, you know, um, that, that by the definitions we have here, that would require a catenary. Um, the, the multiple unit, the TIG M, for example, would be a multiple unit um, service. No, it's, it would not. It, it's more of a light rail, rail vehicle, just to, to answer that question. What, what defines that? I'm trying to understand because, in effect, it's a, go ahead. It's a, um, so, the basis, uh, the basic definition is going to be whether or not it's FRA compliant, um, and then um, it, it puts it into the multiple unit camp. Um, but multiple units um, uh, have, as as Mark presented in his pre part of the presentation, a um, uh, power driven cab at, at either end. end. So. Again, I think, but it would could that the multiple unit could be battery. It says on the list here it could be battery Correct. operated, which is I think most people's expectation, or hydrogen or something self self contained propulsion of some form. Correct. Um, and I think that needs to be made kind of clear to people because I've got a lot of questions from members of the public who don't who think you know is the is the multiple unit thing a, a big lo huge locomotive that you know that's really with the the uh, traditional train uh, model. So I think in, in, in making the presentation to the public, I think there's a need for a little bit more clarity there. What it is that's driving these definitions of the three different types? Because I think people, you think of light rail, they're kind of thinking of the middle, sure. the middle one as well, the three that you've presented. Sure, the, the, um, so I think I can clarify that or, or attempt to. Um, as you mentioned, locomotive hall trains is is really readily you know understandable. That's more akin to what you would see with um, you know your Amtrak service. It's similar to freight, where you've got the the vehicle that drives the train, um, and then you have your your carriages, your cars that are attached to that locomotive or locomotives, um, and then you can attach more, take off more uh, some cars. Um, and provide flexibility in terms of capacity and ridership, but it's a bigger vehicle, um, heavier. Um, light rail uh, um, is obviously a lighter vehicle. It's not going to be FRA compliant for for their um, crashworthiness, for instance. So light rail vehicles like overhead catenary, um, they um, have a, a smaller driven vehicle that will drive the, the train set. They can also um, had cars attitude and not, but um, you're going to need that overhead catenary or third rail um, terms for propulsion, for the energy for the propulsion. Um, there are battery ones, but um, it, if we were to go back to the, the slide or if you look at the, the presentation, um, or if you go to the staff report, um, battery does not provide a long range. So a, a battery options today do not provide for, for um, your light rail or your multiple units, the, the distance to go from Pajaro to Santa Cruz on a charge. Um, and we're talking only about the type of vehicles that are CPUC um, approved at this point. So we're not talking about vehicles that people may see in other countries that um, are not uh, approved by the CPUC or the FRA, for, um, if we're talking about the FRA compliant vehicles. Um, multiple units are in the middle, and they are, are not, they're, they're more uh, a newer technology. They kind of are a mix of the two, so they're going to be definitely lighter than your locomotive haul trains, uh, but they're going to be heavier tr traditionally than your, your light ray vehicles. The multiple units um, have the, the, the cab driving in either direction, um, and then they have the propulsion usually internally, so they don't need to have the overhead catenary or a third rail, they can have the propulsion um, as part of the equipment. 
Uh, so that's the key char characteristics. Um, if we need to go into some more detail, we can you know, come back to the commission and have a, um, a more thorough explanation of some of the uh, differences, um, or I can take some questions today. So um, again, responding to things people in the public have asked me about or quite commented on, um, the, the, the constraints that require, that, that sort of look like they're ruling out the light rail, um, really have to do with um, funding from the, from the feds um, and the state, uh, whether they'd be willing to fund something, uh, they, they might not be willing to fund a light rail given the, what they're trying to do around the rest of the state and, and access to the rest of the system in the state. Uh, those are constraints that drive, that knit, uh, militate against the uh, light rail alternative, aside from the catenary question. Um, so even if you separated t uh, temporarily by time, had freight run at night on our system and the passenger stuff during the day, it doesn't fix those two problems. Is, is my understanding correct? That is correct. Okay. My, my second issue has to do with, I, I think you need to provide the public with a lot of much more, we had a presentation on this earlier, so we, we got some idea of what the public are gonna see when they go to the, the site for the virtual weigh-in. Um, what One of the biggest concerns and debates and issues we get letters to the editor about have to do with setback requirements from the trail or from this, the bank, this on the sides or whatever. I think you need to make really clear to the public what defines those setback requirements. Where is it written? Who tells us they have to have this many feet? What kind of exceptions can be made? So aside from just showing in your work, this is how we're designing the alignment, and this is how many feet we have here, why is it necessary to have that number of feet? Could it be shorter? Are there exceptions allowed that would have a trail that basically is that far back, but in some places closer and still be legally uh, possible? So in the presentation that we got, and the, from what I've seen, uh, I think there needs to be a, a more vigorous kind of a presentation of what's defining those setbacks. Why are, why are they required? Who's demanding that? Um, why is that a constraint that we have to obey? Uh, as opposed to people thinking, oh no, I, 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 there's, San Diego's got less, uses less room than that. They, they don't have that much setback. So why are we required to have that setback? So that's just my comment about how you do, do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Questions, comments? Uh, Commissioner Peterson and then Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Um, I had a couple more questions about um, light rail. And just to make sure that I understand correctly, um, it's not compatible with freight based on the rails, the basic infrastructure? No, it's not necessarily the infrastructure itself. Um, though, when you're designing a light rail system, you, there's different constraints. So you may choose to, or elect to have some, some various different infrastructure that um, you may choose to have that's not compatible with freight. But on the basic level, it's whether or not um, it's regulated and allowed in terms of regulations. So the basic fundamental is, is whether or not the vehicles that are operating on the line are FRA compliant, Federal Railroad Administration. Light rail vehicles are not FRA compliant and would not be able to be interoperable with the, the state rail system or the Union Pacific rail line. We would have to temporarily separate or do, or do a separate track system um, to be able to allow light rail vehicles on the branch line. Okay. Yeah, so, um, but it sounds like there are options that maybe people would think of in like common understanding of m more towards light rail in the multiple unit category. I don't understand that question. Could you well, just rephrase? lighter, more streamlined, um, but allowable on a freight line. Yes, so multiple right. units are kind of the hybrid. They're mm -hmm. between the light rail and the locomotive hauled trains, so they will be lighter 
than locomotives and, and smaller, but they will not be as small and light as some of the light rail systems. And, you know, the big, the big difference between them as well is the vehicles are FRA compliant. They, um, FRA um, recently in the industry has um, allowed the, or certified them for crash readiness. And do you foresee a significant um, difference in the availability of uh, models of trains in the next five or ten years that could, you know, become as, as small or as cheap as light rails in the multiple unit category that is approved for freight? Um, they probably will, will not be generically as small or as lightweight as the light rail vehicles. Mm -hmm. Um, because of some of the, currently some of the, the reasons why we have the FRA compliant and crash worthiness, um, th those vehicles, if where they were to crash, um, would um, meet certain requirements from the FRA, um, which adds to some of the, the vehicle weight and mass. Um, the, and, uh, to answer your, your question, maybe a little bit to the side is, Currently, there's a lot of investment in the multiple unit space by the industry and by the state of California. Specifically, the state of California is um, investing in a lot of that technology and exploring that technology for use in the state rail system. So over the next five to 10 years, I do expect, and the industry expects that there will be um, further advancements in the multiple unit space specifically. Um, so we do expect there to be um, more options available. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Brown, did you have a question? Well, um, I get, it's, a, it's a question that uh, is, is not going to get answered today, but I really wanted to put uh, a fine point on Commissioner Rotkin's question uh, or um, suggestion or a recommendation that we have more information to help explain the, um, the setbacks and I want to expand that to, to say that I think more transparency around the assumptions in general related to speeds along per particular alignments. I mean, the assumptions that are being made aren't entirely clear to me um, more broadly. So I feel, and the setback issue is obviously one of particular concern for neighbors, and we're getting a lot of questions about that. But there are other questions, um, you know, and, and so I think about, for example, when I'm looking at the uh, vehicle options, you know, uh, saying that uh, a pro is that, uh, you know, the, the, the mid, the, the multiple unit trains could go up to 100 miles per hour. Well, where in Santa Cruz County is that a pro for anybody? <laughs> um, is, you know, and a con for light rail being that it can't go over 60 miles per hour. Are we envisioning, uh, you know, higher speeds than that? And so it, I guess it just raises multiple questions. So really trying to understand the assumptions that um, HDR and, uh, and uh, the, the team is building in there uh, I think would be helpful. I think it would be helpful for people who are weighing in in this virtual open house as well because when you look at the option, I mean, I, now that I can actually access it, I'm looking at it and it, it, it you know, anybody could go in and vote for high speed as their top priority, um, but that's not necessarily realistic for our context. Um, again, just giving people some framework for understanding why these questions are being asked or, or what assumptions you're making related to um, setback speeds, you know, boarding levels, you know, sidings, the, you know, all of these things, <laughs> and and where and and as Commissioner Rotkin suggested, where those requirements are coming from, because we hear different messages from different stakeholders at the CPUC, C, you know, the CTC, and then from from you all. Um, so yeah, just just really hoping I, that we can get some more information on that. I can provide two things which will clarify some points, and then Sandy, um, well, I could I could make a question to the commission, uh, a recommendation maybe. Um, one with respect to the speeds, the just to clarify, the the design team is is not designing or anything to go over sixty miles an hour on the line. That's not a goal of the project. The intent of the project is designed up to sixty miles an hour. Um, where feasible on the rail line. 
And that will be more apparent through the refined conceptual alignment that will come out in the fall. So when we have modeling of the line with actual vehicle equipment um, that we're inputting into our model, we will be able to see where we can get to certain design or to certain speeds. Um, and that affects obviously the overall total transit time and our headways. So um, to, to clarify that for the, those listening and, and to the commission. And then a point of clarification, I know level boarding is also very important to the community. All three of the vehicle types can have level boarding. Um, so uh, obviously some of them have higher um, floor heights than others, but that just means your stations would have to be designed differently. But all of them can accommodate level boarding and that would be the intent of the project. And then um, correct me, Mitch, if, I, if I'm wrong in this, but we could recommend to the commission that if you guys would like to have a focused discussion on the, the CPUC requirements for the horizontal clearance, we could set up a, um, like a, an item for a TPW to go into more detail on those, on those aspects. Uh, hold on, we're going to let uh, Commissioner Brown finish and then we're going to, Commissioner Peterson's waiting and then we'll come to you, Commissioner Rock. So, um, I, I think it would be helpful uh, because there is so, there's so much interest in this and it's just going to grow. Um, but also just some, you know, something in a, a writ, some kind of written reference that here, you know, I, again, I'm just looking at what you're saying versus what we see in the survey and, and how would people who are joining that virtual uh, open house know this if they aren't here for every moment of the conversation. So just something that basically references where these requirements are, I think would be really helpful as well as a, a session at some point. Thank you. If it's possible to get a representative from the CPUC to join the meeting, I think that would be unbelievably helpful as well. Uh, Commissioner Peterson and then Commissioner Rotkin. Thank you. Yeah, I just um, kind of wanted to follow in that line of thought, I think that we should be uh, framing this information to the public in the public outreach uh, initiative we're working on here in the lens of what is applicable to Santa Cruz County in this specific project. And I think, like, why is it a pro that high speed's possible 100 miles per hour if that is not at all applicable to Santa Cruz and the project that we're talking about? And similarly, a con of lower speeds at a 60 mile an hour max, if we're only looking at a 60 hour mile max, how is that a con? And I think similarly with the locomotive hull trains, you could look at you know long range, high speed ability, is that really a pro in the context of what we're talking about? And just framing it in the you know clearest way to the public that we can. And I think all three of those are pretty misleading and could be adjusted. Um, my main question that I wanna ask is what are the ramifications of selecting a light rail vehicle that is not compatible with freight for this project? I can answer that. Um, so ramifications would be that you cannot operate a light rail vehicle in the same space as a freight rail vehicle. Um, that's a, a requirement from our, our regulators. Um, we would have to design a system that would be separate from the freight rail system. That could be achieved in various ways. The two main ones would be temporarily separate. So you've you physically separate the system time in a, in a time sensitive fashion. So you could operate light rail vehicles in the daytime, for instance, as, a, as an mm. opportunity or in the freight rail at night. So that would be in consultation with the freight rail operator. Um, you would have to lock out the, in a sense, the freight rail from uh, um, accessing the system so that there's no chance that a freight rail, a freight train could collide with a light rail vehicle. The uh, other way of doing it would be separate tracks and separate system um, so that the light rail vehicle would be totally and wholly separate all the time from the freight rail system. Um, you would, you know, those are the two ways of doing it. The other option is, or other ramifications are interoperability. So you would not be able to operate 
light rail vehicles on the rest of the state rail network. So it wouldn't be able to access, you know, bring, bring passengers from um, Santa Cruz or any of our Santa Cruz counties to Gilroy, Salinas, things of that nature um, in the future. Should that be something that the service would like to do? The other main issue at this point is the funding um, regime or the, the, the landscape for funding. Currently, the the state and federal grants that we see out there are um, interoperable, uh, require interoperability for the most part. Um, a lot of the money is putting in, pushing into, um, into to trains, inner city trains. Um, so those are, are vehicles that could go from one region to another or, pro or provide an inner city um, service. So um, it would be compliant for inner, inner, inner city service to um, bring passengers from Santa Cruz to Pajaro and then get on uh, another train that can go to a, a, another city, another region. Um, that is where the um, the federal government and the state government are, are putting their, their money at. So um, in terms of funding for this project, and we know that funding, uh, we, we don't have enough local funds and we're gonna need um, a lot of support in getting a, a passenger rail service on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. So funding is, is key. Um, doing a light rail service or, um, or, or keeping the option for, for, for um, light rail makes it more challenging for our federal and state partners to be supportive of our project in terms of funding and, and other resources. Yeah, and I guess that I, I would personally feel that that would be very valuable information to include in this public outreach is uh, things associated with cost because I, I know for a lot of the residents here in Santa Cruz County that is a huge concern and a huge point of contention of whether or not this um, having a passenger train at all is feasible. So if one of them has a huge likelihood of receiving grant funding, uh, making it more realistic compared to the other, I think that's information that should be included in something like this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Rocky. And to, the, to that point, well, um, the project team will, will take them, I'm taking notes and our team is taking your questions and, and concerns and we will look to see um, what we can do to address some of these things um, in this engagement period. Commissioner Rotkin? No? Yes, please, Commissioner Pegler. So I won't repeat what the questions already came from Commissioners Rotkin and Brown, but I, I want a, a couple clarifications. One, um, you mentioned the modeling of ridership and estimates of uh, where the ridership might be. What was the time frame for delivering that information in your schedule? So we're going to do that over the summer and early fall months, and we'll come back with a refined conceptual alignment in the fall. And then all of it, so that will be like a, a technical um, component of the project. And then the concept report, will, which comes out at the end of the project, will um, have a, a final analysis and presentation of it. And I ask that because it, from my perspective, knowing where the ridership is going to and coming from has much to do with the station traffic, what we've called first mile, last mile, trying to get to destinations, and to some extent, perhaps even the character of the vehicles. And so I'm, I'm just trying to fit those together and keep the locomotive ahead of the carriages, if you will. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned uh, that light rail could still reach Pajaro Junction, and. Again, for lack of a better term, I'd almost refer to that as a first 20 mile, last 20 mile connection to the state system. That seems like if we manage the freight access issues on our rail segments, uh, that would be possible. Is that a yes or no? Does it that would be possible, yes. The, um, the connection at Pajaro Station would um, require consultation with TAMSI, who is leading that project as well as with UP, Union Pacific. So that is a Union Pacific property. Um, there, are there are challenges of, of bringing light rail to the Union Pacific, uh, Union Pacific Yard and, and the future Pajaro Station, um, but it, there are challenges that could be conceivably resolved and light rail bringing brought to uh, Pajaro Station. 
with the multiple unit and locomotive all of this easier mm -hmm. um, because you could, uh, for instance, bring those vehicles um, onto the, the state rail network, um, whereas you would have to wholly separate the lines um, and have a separate line connection with a light rail vehicle. Okay, thank you. Riley, I understand there's a waiver process through the FRA that would allow light rail to be interoperable with freight that was used in uh, Baltimore and San Diego in the past. Is that something that we could potentially consider in the future should we determine that we want to move forward with light rail vehicles? I don't have an answer to that one, um, Chair Brown. Um, looks like Mitch, you're... Yes, we can consider it. Okay. Um, all right. That's good to know. So uh, any further comments or questions from the commission? All right, uh, I'm gonna take it to public comment with just a reminder that uh, this is a public hearing today. There won't be any final votes made by the commission on conceptual alignment or uh, vehicle types, and we are looking for your input <coughs> on both. So we'll start uh, with those in the room for any public comment on this item. Hi, welcome. welcome. Thank you, Chair Brown. Uh, I'm Matt Farrell with Friends of the Rail and Trail, and I just want to share with the Commission that our board shared some of the same confusion and lack of clarity that was expressed by commissioners in your comments earlier today. And so we don't have a clear comment on the recommendation today. Secondly, I would like to say that it feels a little out of order to have a survey presented at the commission meeting today, whereas the rest of the information you're considering was presented in advance of the meeting. It really competes against clarity and transparency in terms of the public being able to come to the meeting today and have some input on the content of that survey material. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Tina. I live in Aptos, Tina Andrietta. Segment 17 has two alternatives, 17A and 17B, which directs the trail away from sensitive wetlands to a safe, buffered, and separated bikeway on San Andreas Road it, and Beach Street. Excuse me, is this the right item? Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. This was about conceptual alignments and it included in the staff report some information about oh, trail segments. No worries. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> um, segment 17B connects to far more businesses, homes, beaches, and other destinations along San Andreas Roads and Beach Street without competing with rail projects for space. Please consider realignments to streets that improve connectivity while prioritizing rail over trail. Please consider the needs of Watsonville's community. And may I direct you to these wonderful um, comments on the wall, opportunity through diversity, unity through cooperation. And they're in English and Spanish. Let's not forget Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos in Rio del Mar. And I want to thank uh, everybody for, for the conversations and the topics and the details that we're seeing. Um, I, I echo what uh, uh, my friend Tina mentioned. And I'm happy. You know, it's interesting. 17B and 17A were uh, discussed back in 2015 or longer ago. It, it's a situation where instead of 160 million, the cost could be 10 to 20 million, and 17B can connect to more beaches and homes and businesses, and it doesn't uh, run the trail through the wetlands where it doesn't connect to anything. Um, but on the on the rail vehicle matter, I'm I'm proud that so far this commission has adopted the uh, the freight standard for bridges and so forth because. I hope everyone realizes that uh, the standard gauge freight line tracks and bridges are downward compatible. Obviously, we ran the TIGM 
light, super light vehicle on the freight line. And so except for the distance from platforms to the, the vehicles, the, the tracks are the same. So you build high, everything is downward compatible. Can it be light rail? I, I hope so. Um, there's, there's something, you know, the, uh, the light, uh, the, the, the San Diego Sprinter, which I've ridden and I recommend giving it a try, it's a rather large train, but it operates with temporal separation on a freight line. It connects service to the coaster, which is a large uh, locomotive pool system along the coast, but it doesn't need to get on that rail line. And I think here, I don't think the train that we want needs to be large enough to get on the main line and mix with Caltrain and Amtrak. Uh, and so the, I think the job is to look for those solutions uh, and, and talk to rail manufacturers about what's coming down the line. Thanks. Thank you. Any further comment in the room? Seeing none, we'll go to comments online. We have two online, uh, Brian Peoples and then Michael Lewis and Gene Brocklebank. Brian, you're allowed to talk. Yeah, hi, this is Brian Peoples with Trail Now. Uh, plain and simple, this isn't the way you design a system. You know, and this is why you're having overruns, why you're, you're not doing, a what you have to do is define your requirements. And the best way I can explain it is if you're building a house and you're going to a manufacturer of homes and you're going to buy a model, you don't go and just say, go look at all the models. You have to understand your property restrictions. You haven't defined, staff has not defined, what are the restrictions to the train, such as the Coastal Commission. You haven't even touched that, such as uh, sea level rising, such as beach access, such as the boardwalk. You know, what is the boardwalk going to say when you say you want to have 60 trains a day going by there on their property? Or the Roaring Camp, which will no longer be able to have their operations. Those are the things that you have to look at when you do a design. You look at the property restrictions before you go and start modeling or, or showing the public, hey, we're going to have these cool trains. Which one do you want to pick? That's not the way you do system design. So I'm a little concerned that the consultant here, who should be having experience on how to design a train system, would understand how you first look at what are the restrictions to the property? What can we put in there? What can't we? And it's not about a fancy train that we want. You have to do systems engineering. You have to, you know, and this is why you're having major cost overruns. This is why the trails uh, been built that doesn't even meet your setback requirements, nor will it meet your uh, alignment requirements, uh, because you're, the train that he's already said would have to be readjusted. So you're building a trail designed for a train, but you don't even know the train you're going to have. So you're all you. You need to step back and look at how you do design work. Over. Thank you. Next, we have Michael Lewis and Gene Brocklebank. Hi, this is this is Gene Brocklebank again. Um, first, I want to thank the consultants for the work they've done so far. Um, I did go to the interactive online survey, um, and uh, uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> I also learned a lot today from the discussion between the commission members and the consultants. Um, and I know we're going to get a lot more information as the months move along, but I, I am really impressed with some of the stuff that I've learned so far today. I did have one question. There is um, an aerial view of where the uh, trail leaves the corridor and it leaves the corridor at 38th Avenue east of where the mobile home parks are when that narrowest tiny little bit of corridor that leaves it at 38th Avenue goes north and then east and comes back to the corridor on 47th Avenue and um, I can't figure out looking at Google Maps I just am not sure why that uh, diversion from the corridor uh, happened. Um, you don't have to answer that question today because I will be going to the um, open house and maybe we can have the discussion then. So um, 
I do agree that this work, that the, this good work that the consultants are doing now to inform the commission should probably have been done five years ago. And uh, we would have all, the public, the commission, uh, everyone would have benefited. But that's, um, that's then and this is now. So continue forward with the good work you're doing. And I think that we can all be able to make better informed decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further public comments on Zoom? There are no further comments online. All right. Uh, with that, we will bring it back to the commission uh, for any further discussion, deliberation, guidance to staff. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you to the consultants. Thank you to staff. Thank you for everyone working on this. All right, let's go back. Item 36. Uh, we are at Measure D, Active Transportation Category Capacity, and I'll turn it over to staff. Good morning, Commissioners. Grace Blakesley of your staff. Um, I'm here this, well, now it's an afternoon, um, to discuss the Measure D, Active Transportation Capacity uh, with you and delivery of coastal rail trail projects. Next slide, please. Um, just as a brief reminder, the voters approved Measure D in 2016 in the, in the Associated Expenditure Plan. Um, it allows RTC to collect a half cent sales tax and spend the revenues in accordance with the approved Measure D Expenditure Plan. Funds can, under the active transportation category, uh, funds can be used for trail construction, trail operations and management, as well as maintenance and um, maintenance of the rail corridor. To date, Measure D active transportation funds have leveraged significant state and federal funding and segments of the Coastal Rail Trail are moving forward based on these funding awards. At the April 18th meeting, RTC staff presented various scenarios for future Measure D active transportation allocations for the Measure D active transportation category. The item in presentation today is in response to the RTC's action at their April 18th meeting to commit to fully funding segments 10 and 11 and to analyze scenarios for future funding of segments 13 through 20 located in the southern portion of Santa Cruz County. I will review some of those scenarios shared with the RTC at their April 18th meeting again today. In addition, I will provide information about alternative funding scenarios and describe how they could me impact Measure D um, active transportation category capacity. Next slide, please. So as uh, mentioned at the April 18th meeting, 174 million in Measure D active transportation category revenues are projected for the life of Measure D from fiscal year 2016, 2017 to 2046, 47. Revenue estimates are adjusted at least annually and can vary based on actual revenues and interest rates interest rate estimates going forward. Uh, to date, 63 million in Measure D active transportation category revenues have been programmed and approved by the Regional Transportation Commission, and you can see this in the approved five-year Measure D plans. <clears throat> The 63 million invested have resulted in over 18 miles of trail that are now under development or constructed or in construction. Based on current programming, there is a balance of 93 million in Measure D active transportation revenues. RTC staff evaluates these investments of future revenues and provides, and provides options to the Regional Transportation Commission about how to strategically invest these funds. But it's important to note that actual funding available at any time is significantly impacted by the timing of the proposed expenditures and bonding against future revenues. This is because of the interest cost associated with borrowing the funds. The cost of the project is also informed by how project costs increase due to their escalation. So I will review a range of funding scenarios and project delivery options with you in a, f a future slide. But I wanted to give you an example. At the April 18th meeting, I presented what could be considered an existing condition. It was referred to as scenario one, showing that there is a balance of an estimated 97 million in Measure D active transportation remaining capacity based on previously programmed decisions. 
And so it's important to understand that this assumes a relatively limited amount of bonding, only 20 million, with the remaining 97 million spent on what may be referred to as a pay-as-you-go basis. So by committing Measure D active transportation funds to the project sooner will require additional bonding with the accompanying debt service, thus reduce, reducing the Measure D active transportation funding available. Next slide, please. So you're probably familiar with this slide. Um, this is the 32 miles of coastal rail trail that um, are defined in the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Master Plan. And this provides an overview of the, status of, the stat status of the project development. The areas shown in red indicate that the project is funded through construction and the green sections are completed. The focus of today's agenda item is discussing funding strategies for the trail segments that extend from Rio Del Mar through the city of Watsonville to Pajaro, shown in pink on the slide. Another component of today's item is addressing potential cost increases in the segments that have already received state and federal funding, largely segments 8, 9, 10, and 11 that were discussed at your April meeting. Next slide, please. Okay. Okay. So this is another slide that's showing the uh, portion of the trail segments 13 through 20. This is a slide through uh, from the zero emission passenger rail and trail project that Riley was discussing in the prior agenda item. The 13 through 20 are shown on the dash line highlighted in green. Um, the, this portion of the trail traverses the communities of Aptos, La Selva Beach, Harkin Slough, and city of Watsonville and Pajaro. And this, the segments 13 would provide pedestrian and bicycle connections for individuals living in and around the city of Watsonville to Aptos, Live Oak, and the city of Santa Cruz, as well as south to Pajaro. Um, there are approximately 34,000 uh, residents living within a half mile of these segments, and three of these areas are designated as disadvantaged populations. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit about options for project delivery for segments 13 through 20. Um, right now, as you heard from uh, Riley in the prior item, uh, they are completing the alignment of these sections as part of the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. Once the pro alignments are complete, there's the opportunity to move these projects forward into the project approval and environmental phase, which is referred to as PAED often. And this establish, involves establishing the project footprint and analyzing the potential impacts, the environmental impacts of the project. And then once the project has completed the project approval and environmental phase, it can move into final design. So RTC staff has considered options for advancing these segments, um, including combining environmental review and preliminary design with the environmental review and preliminary design for passenger rail and trail as part of the next phase of the zero emission passenger rail and trail project, which would initiate in 2025 or 26. Another option is to use local funds to advance this project development, which could include the Measure D active transportation category funds, state transportation improvement program funds, surface transportation block grant funds, or also referred to as regional surface transportation program exchange funds. RTC staff also expects to apply for a Cycle 8 state active transportation program grant funds uh, to fund project approval and environmental document phase for segments 13 through 20. And to be most competitive, a grant proposal should propose a local match and advance the project to the extent possible prior to the grant submittal. Typically projects that are construction ready are the most um, competitive for some of these grant funds. Next slide, please. Okay, this, this table is also in the packet, um, if it's easier to view um, in your packet. So at the April 18th meeting, the RTC considered these scenarios that it, and discussed options for um, addressing the potential funding gaps for coastal rail trail projects under development, as well as how to come up with a plan to fund ongoing corridor and trail maintenance over the life of Measure D. As mentioned before, RTC staff directed, I mean, excuse, RTC directed staff to move forward with cost reduction measures and continue to pursue additional fundings for coastal rail trail projects segments 10 and 11 to fully fund the project. 
Also at the April 18th meeting, RTC directed staff to return to the RTC with information about setting aside 45 million in Measure D active transportation category funds for the development of coastal rail trail segments 13 through 20, setting aside 45 million for maintenance, and 7 million to assist with budgets for segments currently under development. So, uh, I've provi provided here five different scenarios for you to consider. Um, these are meant to provide different options um, and none of these funds have been programmed. Today you're not being asked to program these funds. This is for informational purposes only. You'll notice that the projected revenue for each scenario, which is the first row, um, thank you Amy for pointing it out, is the same. So we'll start with 174 million. And the third row, the 63 million, which is the already previously approved program funds, is the same under all scenarios. And the second row, the amount of borrowing that would be needed to deliver the projects varies in each scenario dependent based on the anticipated uh, revenues and the projects that are being delivered. Uh, scenarios one and two are the same as the scenarios provided to you at your April 18th meeting to try to provide a point of reference. Scenario one provides a picture of available revenues based on the previously approved funds, 63 million and 20 million in borrowing based on 2022 cost estimates for coastal rail trail segments eight through 11. Scenario two assumes that Measure D active transportation revenues fully fund potential cost increases for segments eight and 11 based on current cost estimates. So that's the 43 million that you see shown um, in the fourth row for scenario two. Should RTC expend Measure D active transportation revenues to fully fund segments eight through 11, so that 43 million, that's based on that current cost estimates, that current cost estimates that I mentioned, that would leave the Measure D active transportation category a balance of 15 million, and there would be insufficient funds um, to advance some of the, all of the other remaining segments. This scenario, um, in order to deliver these projects as currently scheduled, would require 72 million in bonding with a debt service cost of 125 million. Segment scenario three reflects the analysis requested by the Regional Transportation Commission at their 18, April 18th meeting and assumes 45 million and set aside for the development of segments 13 through 20. Uh, 45 million uh, for segments 13 through 20 is uh, close to a 20% match uh, for those segments, which is considered, um, I think a commissioner asked this at the last meeting, what we just assume as the match uh, when we're putting forward grant applications, we typically assume a minimum 20% match. And actually to speak to uh, the current member of the public discussing segments 17, uh, Commissioner Schifrin's correct, there is a discussion of this, the segment 17 A and B alignment also in the staff report because the cost of the segment 17 A along the environmentally sensitive area is significantly more than if it was routed um, in the alignment of 17 B along Beach Street and San Andreas Road. So this 40, if, uh, when I'm talking about the 20% match, I'm, a match, I'm assuming the 17, the 17B alignment, which uses on -street existing on-street facilities and enhances those and, and removes it from the rail line for that four and a half miles along Harkins Loop. So in this situation, um, as uh, this analysis that was requested by the Regional Transportation Commission in April, um, you can see that remaining Measure D capacity is 12 million. Um, and absent, so in this scenario, um, absent the receipt of any new funding or reduced cost for segments eight through 11, um, this, uh, this scenario would not fully fund segments eight through 11 based on uh, potential cost increases. Scenario four is intended to accomplish um, supporting, con continue to support constructions of the segments eight through 11 that already have um, been awarded state and federal funds, and then also allocating some funds, 10 million to advance segments 13 through 20. Uh, scenario four assumes that that 10 million for th 13 through 20 would um, help to get the pre-construction activity started in fiscal year 26, 27, once the zero emission passenger rail and trail project concept report is complete. Scenario four also assumes a 20 million in Measure D active transportation revenues are reserved for segments eight through 11, and that the remaining balance or the difference between the 20 million and the 43 million um, potential cost increases are met by 
outside funding, state or federal funding, and project cost reduction measures. Scenario four also assumes approximately 50% of trail and corridor maintenance costs are funded by measure active transportation uh, revenues, not the, not the um, full 36 or 30 million that we've discussed previously. But again, in scenario four, absent the receipt of any new funding or reduced costs, this scenario would not fully fund the potential cost increases on segments eight through 11. And for scenario four, I mean, excuse me, scenario five, you can see if we had our wish list and um, wanted to fund everything that we've uh, previously talked with the commission about, you'll see that the measure D is, is oversubscribed if you include fully funding the costs of segment eight through 11 potential cost increases, you need to add in the set aside that was requested as well as, um, actually that one doesn't have, that one doesn't have the cost and does not include the cost of trail maintenance and quarter maintenance, apologies, but you can still see that it's oversubscribed if you um, set aside the funding for segments uh, eight, 13 through 20 as requested as well as the fully funding potential cost increases for segments eight and 11. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, you know, Measure D will be oversubscribed, as I said, and that's described in that scenario five. That's the first bullet there. Um, second, RTC is continuing to seek state and federal funding for coastal rail trail projects and identify cost reduction measures as directed by the commission at their April meeting. And today RTC staff is recommending that we continue to seek, seek state and federal funds for segments 13 through 20 as part of the zero emission passenger rail and trail project or as a standalone project. Also to consider options for using measure active, um, active transportation category funds or other local funds to advance segments 13 through 20 through pre-construction activities. Um, also consider prioritizing RTC discretionary funds to develop priority bicycle and pedestrian safety improvements in the city of Watsonville, which could include portions of the uh, Coastal Rail Trail Segment 18. And then finally, to continue to work with local jurisdictions to identify alternative sources of funding for trail maintenance to preserve the Measure D funds for trail construction. And that concludes, concludes my report. Great, thank you so much. We'll start with commissioner comments and questions. Yes, Commissioner Montesino. So um, thank you for the, all that analysis and work. Um, um, but so which scenario that I, I can, uh, y uh, that your uh, staff is recommending? We are not recommending a specific scenario today. We can return to the commission when we update our five-year measure D plan in the future um, to make a recommendation about future funding. This item is um, in response to the question to provide the analysis to the commission. I see, I see Director Mitch Weiss wants to say something. Yeah, well, and if I can, with the action that, that the commission recently took, uh, we are essentially at scenario two. Oh. Um, and so absent any, you know, we're, we're gonna continue to look for cost reductions and, and seek additional funding. And that, if, if we're able to do that on eight through 11, that takes that, that 43 million that's in there and reduces that and makes that available. But this is kind of our, I mean, I hesitate, to, I hesitate to say worst case scenario because everything can always get worse. But, but this is, if we, if we can't cut cost, if we can't get additional funding, based on what we now, now know, that's where we're at. Did I get that right? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for providing that context. That's well, I, I, I hate to, you know, uh, not disagree, but you know, uh, you know, challenge you because I think, you know, um, something that uh, that uh, that you have worked on. I think uh, I like scenario two because it gives, you know, some parameters to a lot of things. So you continue that work of 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 getting grants and 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 getting some, you know, some extra funding for uh, other segments, but you're still, uh, you know, prioritizing South County. Yeah, I, well, and I just want to say, I, I, I completely agree, and that's why there are a number of recommendations that are laid out in the staff report that talk to, that speak to what other funding we could use to help prioritize work in the South County to really set that up for better competing for state or federal funding. Commissioner Schifrin? Yes, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, on, I'm glad the chart is, the table is up. On scenario one, it says that uh, segments eight through uh, uh, 11 additional funding, zero dollars are gonna be necessary. Why then do we need a, 
bonding of $20 million? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. So um, when the commission took action in May 2022 to program funding to provide the 20% match for um, the active transportation program grants um, for 8 and 11, so in order that they could take their grant applications forward and say we have a 20% match for Measure D, that assumes that required a $20 million um, bonding effort to deliver the projects on schedule. So that was already assumed uh, based on uh, prior cost estimates from 2022 that were included in the active transportation program grant applications. But the remaining capacity is shown as 97 million. Couldn't the $20 million local match come out of that 97 million and then uh, save $34 million in debt service? I mean, that would reduce the It's because of the time. So the 97 million is the balance on a pay as you go. So that would be if we just, we, we waited to have the revenues available on an annual basis throughout the life of Measure D. But in order to deliver the projects earlier on on schedule according with, the, with their applicate grant applications, so for example, we're assuming kind of a mid-year 2026 construction uh, period, and we would need to borrow uh, future revenues uh, to deliver those projects. So that's what the 20 million is. Those are the bond proceeds um, that then ultimately end up in a debt service of 34 so million. So what you're saying is when we're um, projecting, when the commission's projecting to be able to start construction of segments 8 through 11, we, there will not be enough Measure D money to pay for the local share, therefore bonding will be necessary. Correct. Is that correct? So if the construction gets delayed, as construction tends to happen um, in most cases, um, then the, that amount of bonding might be reduced or unnecessary depending on how long the delay is. Is that? I think that there's there's two things to consider. I mean, the answer is yes, but it's I would say, in given the time frame we're looking at for delivery of segments eight through eleven, bonding would still be required. I don't think we would have sufficient revenues, for example, even through twenty thirty, uh, to deliver those construction projects without bonding. Um, I'm sorry. What was your second question? That was the that was, oh, okay. that was the sorry. question. But my next question is kind of a follow up. There are assumptions built into this table, and um, in terms of the bonding, the required bonding, you know, there, I always were, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a pay-as-you-go kind of person, where, and I appreciate that that's the goal of the commission uh, staff, so I, 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 I'm not in any disagreement, but there are certain assumptions built into when these various projects are going to come online and therefore when the bonding is going to be necessary. And I, what, could you go through some of the, the timing? So like with segments 13 to, through 20, um, yeah, I can go, you, I can what, 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 when were you projecting that, the, that those projects would be moving forward? Um, so for this for the scenario under which we pro would program potentially 10 million to advance the environmental phase which is scenario four we assume the environmental phase would be um, kicked off in fiscal year 26 27 uh, for construction which we uh, uh, for segments 13 through 20, where you assume the 45 million, we'd assume that funding would be needed for construction in fiscal year 2030. And these are assumptions, but they're based on how we would see the project delivery moving forward. Um, and then I guess I'm kind of backing into it, the other, for segments 8 through 11, the bonding would occur in 2026, 20, 27. And we look at the bonding uh, that would be needed over a three-year period. And I, I did remember the other point I wanted to make in your comment is, you know, it's there are certainly the interest costs, it, there's, there's debt service costs um, to bonding, but we also have to consider when the projects get pushed out, you have your escalation, escalation costs for the project costs as well, which is, we're assuming right now is 5%. Um, it seems kind of that that's where folks are falling right now. So that's it's something to consider if we push projects out and is and, and a trade-off to uh, bonding and debt service. Okay, thank you. The, those answer the questions about the table. I did, the staff report does mention segment 18 uh, in the city of Watsonville, and I haven't sort of been able to keep track of that. So rather than go into it today, I wonder if at our next meeting we could receive a written 
update on what's the status of uh, segment 18 and its construction. My vague understanding is that it's partially completed, but it's not completely completed. And so uh, I think it would be helpful to uh, understand, at least I'd like to understand better what's going on with that segment. Uh, in the and I can answer it real briefly. I think I'm happy to bring back a report, but I want uh, the commission to know that RTC staff is working very closely with the city of Watsonville right now to try to figure out how to move their priority projects forward and, and where segment 18 falls in that. So segment 18 has been divided into three phases and phase one is completed. And phase two and three have not been moving forward. They've been on hold waiting the development, uh, the completion of the zero emission passenger and rail trail project concept alignment. It's a very tricky area on a curve um, in between Walker Street and Lee Street, and we've worked with a very confi various configurations with their staff, and ultimately the, we've been on hold for the future phases until the completion of the project concept report. But we're actively in discussions with the City of Watsonville staff right now to, to figure out where their priorities are and, and how to advance some of those projects. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, there, the alignment is going to be based on how much space is needed for various rail? There's uh, what we found when looking at developing phases two and three is that there was right of way acquisition would be needed. And in order to determine the the, preferent, the the preferred alignment, we felt that it should be developed in coordination with the passenger rail trail project, passenger rail project. And that's what you're seeing through your zero emission passenger and rail trail project is an alignment for segment 18 that includes both passenger rail in that corridor as well as the trail. Well, we haven't really, I mean, I know they're both going on concurrently for the South County segments, but for the other segments, they've really gone forward independently. And I'm just, you know, while we get a lot of, we get some public criticism of that, that reality, uh, we have been moving forward with those projects. So I, you know, since we've got an elongated timeline for the passenger rail service uh, study. Um, I, I, I would like more of an explanation about why we can't move forward as we've done in the North County with uh, segment 18, irrespective of what's going on with the, with the rail study. Certainly, um, we can bring that information back to you. I, I, I'm sorry. I can understand for 13 from Aptos to Watsonville why they would you know, we want to sort of integrate them together. But since the, they've already been work on segment 18, why we can't, why it is impossible to complete that project uh, isn't really clear to me. Um, so I think it would be helpful to get more information on that. That would be, that'd be fine for us to, we'd be happy to bring that information back. I just wondered if it would be, um, you'd be open to us bringing it back closer to September. We're an actively in conversations with City of Watsonville right now about how that might look. And it, I think it would benefit both of us to have a little bit more time of how, what the next steps might be. If not, you know, we can let you know we're at in August, but I think it might be more informative if we had a little more time to continue to work with them. Okay. All right, Commissioner Montesino. That brings back a lot of questions because as we're working to keep, we'll move back the scenarios. You know, um, like the explanation, but like I said, um, and I like the analysis that's that's gone that's gone through it. But um, you know, uh, you know, uh, we we like some port too on this side. You know, and we have and we have a trail to nowhere. You know, um, and in and in that if we're working on a scenario too. You know, and you know, I like scenario three. I don't know if I I would get the votes for it, but like I said, given an analysis of uh, if you're bringing it back and, and that date, um, can you give an analysis of of the cost and how we can move that forward sooner? Um, segment eighteen specifically, or the entire range? Segment eighteen oh, sure. specifically. Yeah, no, that that will include that. Thank you. Further questions or comments from commissioners? Yeah, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I'm, uh, there's a couple of different uh, numbers here than, uh, but um, the, the could you clarify the uh, the needed f uh, funding for trail and, and rail maintenance? Uh, the uh, the corridor it says the rail corridor is uh, 36 million for and then uh, trail for 30 million. Now is that a, so? That's a total of 63 million for maintenance. Is that correct? 66. So what we've projected is a little over a million in corridor maintenance per year. What we found so far that we haven't been spending um, 
not we haven't expended that much every year, but we still think it's a, a prudent estimate to move forward with, given that we don't know what, where we might have, um, you know, slides or other storm damage that appear on the rail line. So that's for the corridor itself. Is that uh, is is it one of the purposes for uh, the active transportation program to pay for that? It is an allowable expense under the active transportation program. And uh, Louise, you look like you were going to be prepared to answer that. Did you want to? Okay. Um, the report indicates that close to, I think it's 45 million uh, uh, is close to the 20% match. Um, is that pretty accurate today? So that we, we completed the cost estimates for segments 13 through 20 in-house using the Caltrans 11 page cost estimates. So there are a lot of assumptions that go into it before when a project's in such early stages. And then we escalated the cost of the projects out to 2026 to provide kind of a comparison to the other costs of the segments eight and 11 since they're, they're really using a 2026 um, cost. So um, I will have, I think we'll, after the project concepts report is complete, we'll be able to take another look at the cost estimates, but I think, I think they're the best guess what we have right now. Okay, um, and the report assumes that more routine projects such as bike lanes and pedestrian paths uh, can be, uh, there's a backfill of uh, the ultimate train segments. Can, uh, I, for the city of Santa Cruz, which has already participated, I know, can, can it use its own Measure D money for part of that? City of Santa Cruz has committed its, its local share of Measure D funding um, over, I, I want to say it's around $2 million, but it could be $1 to $2 million for that project. Um, and also the County of Santa Cruz previously committed a million and a half in their local funds for that segment eight and nine, or segment nine. Okay, thank you. Um, and the report projects that the Measure D Active Transportation Funds uh, has a total capacity of 174 million, I think, still, and um, that's the rev total estimated revenues over the life of the um, of the measure. And that's until the measure D is end after 30 years. And um, I think we're collecting about. I think you have 5.7 million per year, but aren't we collecting 4.7 or? Oh, uh, well, it, you know, it does vary where, right, in, in today's dollars, it is closer to 4.7, 4.5, actually, I have to look to Tracy if she's here, it's around 4.5, um, but we also have to assume that you're earning interest on the revenues as they are collected if, if you're not, you know, spending them at that time, so that's also part of the calculation, and we're assuming a 5% um, interest uh, revenue. Okay, um, and one other thing is, um, is the MOU with Roaring Camp become completed yet. Uh, it was going to, under discussion, I think, under the last meeting. And if so, is that integrated in, anywhere in this report? We, we have not completed the memorandum of understanding with Roaring Camp yet, but we have, have met with them several times and had another field visit, um, and specifically talking about the work that Roaring Camp could do. Um, they were expecting a draft of the MOU from them any day. We are hoping to have it prior to this meeting, but we are actively working on developing it. It, it is a complicated uh, agreement that we have to work through. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Montesino. So, um, uh, it seems like, you know, through, the, through what, uh, where your estimates, you you're, you're were to have a lot of trails built in the north, correct? And, but there's you know, only in scenario four, are you accounting for um, maintenance estimate? What about the others? It's very challenging, as you can see. If I we added in the trail uh, maintenance costs, we're fully burdened with the. With, if Measure D Active Transportation category was burdened with the trail maintenance costs, we would be oversubscribed in in every single category. Um, if we wanted to also allocate funding to um, the cost potential cost increases and additional development of segments. So, wouldn't the scenario be a more sound, you know, um, scenario to move forward in? Can you, what would, well, wouldn't scenario four would be a more sound, you know, because we're estimating, you know, uh, maintenance that we have to take care of? Yeah, it does, that assumes that some of the maintenance costs uh, for the trail comes from the Measure D Active Transportation category. Yes, that's correct for scenario four. So under our working, there's no money. So where are we so, going to get it? Under what we're working scenario two, what are we? What are we doing? We do not have, in this scenario, it does not assume that the Measure D active transportation category funds trail maintenance throughout the life of the measure. 
if if you know when, what we could talk about is you know that 15 million remaining deep remaining measure D capacity could be used to continue to fund trail maintenance for the segments that are constructed. Thank you. I think it's one thing, it's it's challenging, but it's important to note that when we're talking about the estimates for trail maintenance, we're assuming that different, the segments come online over time and, and, and are constructed and open to the public by 20, 30, 35 time frames. So um, those numbers um, are, are estimates based on when we think the projects are going to be delivered. And they, assu and they assume that that would be the burden on the Measure D active transportation category. And you can see in the staff recommendation, we it's RTC staff thinks that it's important to look at alternative funding sources for the maintenance in order to prioritize trail construction. Yeah, Commissioner Schifrin. I'm going to ask a, a question that's probably going to offend some of the commissioners, and that is, can TDA revenues be used for trail maintenance? I'll let Luis Mendez answer that question. Uh, yes, they could be. Thank you. Would that have to be approved by the commission, though? Correct. Uh, absolutely. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. some of the rev TDA revenues are, I mean, they go directly to the, um, our allocations to the local jurisdictions, and then the local jurisdictions return to the RTC with a quest, request for how to use those funds. That's the process. Commissioner Montesino. So today, um, uh, can we change the direction and get a vote for the uh, Senator Four? You could, you could make last a, you could time, make last a motion. time you told me that I couldn't because I threw out oh, a scenario. Um, these are scenarios published. So, Steve. Can you, re can you repeat the question again? I just yeah, uh, so uh, if I were to, you know, uh, uh, make a motion to uh, change direction and do scenario four. Because um, we're working out of scenario two. Well, this, this, this item is is not an action item, it's a report item that's okay. before the commission. So, I mean, if you wanted to request that something be scheduled as an action item or part of, at the appropriate time to take that kind of action, you could do that. That's not what this is scheduled for though today. I thought that's what I asked the last time, but okay. There, there, that, I, this is an action item to have some action items in there, but it does not specify that the commission adopt any particular scenario, but there are several recommendations that the commission is being asked to act on. So I think if I'm understanding correctly, Commissioner Montesino, the question is legally, is, is he allowed to ask the commission to act on something that is not mentioned in the packet as part of the actions for today? No, that should come back at a subsequent meeting okay. when it's properly agendized. Okay. Seeing no further questions or comments from commissioners, we'll take this to public comment. Uh, do we have any public comment in the room? Hi, welcome. All right, uh, Barry Scott again. And I'm, I'm happy with, and thank you for putting that slide up, I'm happy to see uh, prioritize our RTC discretionary funds to improve, uh, make improvements in Watsonville. Um, I, again, I'm excited about that, that you're all looking at 17B that saves $140 million, can be built sooner, probably doesn't have to wait for the train details to be done and could include, if you look at the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail plans for segment 18, it includes Beach Street and Beach Drive out to Sunset Beach. Potentially, there could be a discussion about proceeding with or, or prioritizing, making a decision on 17B, dropping 17A, and prioritizing construction for Watsonville to get Beach Street all the way out to the beach done as part of its connection to 17B. And I'm sorry, you have to look at the maps to, to understand what I'm talking about. The other thing is um, that, that 17B alternative is indicative of other possibilities for our trail. Um, I was looking at the, the virtual page and I noticed that I think 38th, a, a, a detour if you wish, away from the constrained corridor up to Brommer and back makes so much sense. How much money does that save? Where are the other areas that we could be looking at for improvements like that? I, I, I look at uh, Park Avenue uh, between Monterey and New Brighton where 
to me, widening Park Avenue and keeping the trail, adding to the existing bikeway and making a nice broad trail would, would take out far fewer trees, wouldn't be forcing it down into the, the gully. And you all have a 20 month <laughs> extension, so maybe it's time to be looking at alternatives that save money and uh, create a more useful, less tree harmful uh, trail alignment. Thanks. Thank you. Any further comments in the room? Hi, welcome. Good afternoon, Matt Farrell for Ford. And we just want to say that we also support segment 17B. We feel it offers a lot of benefit as opposed to going through the slough. And that we also um, su support staff and its recommendation for funding projects in Watsonville, including the use of discretionary funds to develop the remainder of segment 18. And finally, I just would like to commend staff for presenting a path forward in trying to resolve reduced resources for pursuing the trail. I think moving forward on these grant applications is your best strategy forward. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further comments in chambers, we will go to Zoom. Do we have any public comments online? Yes, we have three public comments. First, Brian Peoples, then Ben Vernassa, and then Carrie. Uh, Brian Peoples, you're free to speak. Hi, it's Brian Peoples of Trail Now. Absolutely, we support Watsonville. It's about time that Watsonville is no longer a second class citizen when we're talking about transportation solutions. Um, honestly, you know, Santa Cruz is selling them the idea they're going to have a train one day. You're not going to have a train one day, and we should be focusing on this trail. Um, and absolutely begin investing in designing the trail through Park and Slough as a, with no rail. Now, the interesting thing is last month at the Metro meeting, they talked about the Metro deficit in 2027. Um, so the numbers you're talking about for a 12-foot wide trail uh, we can't afford that. You can't afford a $25 million per mile trail. Uh, we need to invest in Metro. So, you know, you guys got to step back and really be realistic. Pretend like it's your money, right? Let's pretend like it's your money you're spending and start planning effectively. Metro is going to have a problem. And so you need to start focusing on that. And Metro is what we're investing in on Highway 1, right? Getting... Watsonville op moving and absolutely a trail will benefit them that is connected from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. So um, I just want to really encourage you to be more realistic in your planning. And when you're not realistic in your planning, you have overruns in both cost and timing, which you have had. This whole meeting's been about overruns and caught on your budgets and and, and timing. So please start to become more realistic in deciding your designs for our transportation system. Thank you. Thank you. Ben Vernassa, you're free to speak. Ben Vernassa and Aptos. Um, I'll call what I'm going to say play by the book, in other words, the ordinance. And the current spending plan for uh, segments 10 and 11 of the Coastal Rail Trade violates the 2020 amended ordinance. The ordinance violation is that the $40 million budget difference between the ultimate trail and the interment trail for, tra for train related infrastructure, and that's not per permissible. The ordinance clearly states that Measure D funds cannot be used for this purpose. Talking about uh, Roaring Camp, be careful what you promise them. It certainly uh, is not a, a done deal, and uh, it certainly shows that there's a train going up and that that's for infrastructure. The bond issue is not needed for the interim trail. It's intended to fund the train needs if you do the ultimate trail. Now, the RTC has two options here. Amend the ordinance, 
follow the amendment process outlined in section 25 to allow for train related spending by one, showing the necessity, two, approval by all four city councils, and three, approval by two thirds of the commissioners, or proceed with the interim trail, rail bank and be begin construction on the interim trail immediately which could be operated, operational within two and a half years. So it's either the ordinance is amended with enormous financial risks, enormous, or approve the interim trail as expressed specifically in the current 2020 amendment. Look at the 2020 amendment, page A5, alpha 5. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kerry, feel free to leave your comments. I find it fiscally irresponsible for the RTC's planning to assume that their funds go up according to inflation, but that the projects do not go up by inflation. That's basically saying I'm planning on having more money tomorrow, but I'm going to pay the cost of what it is yesterday. And we know that the cost of the projects will grow as fast or faster than, than inflation. So you're leaving yourself into a fiscal cliff. Number two, since everybody brought up about 17B, this is great. We should put all our, our rail trails on a 45 mile per hour road and I can tell you how many people would really want to walk along there. And I find that actually very, very dangerous. And if you want to save money on that thing, why not move segment nine over to Mc, uh, Murray Street and segment 10 and 11 over to Bromer? I, I, you know, it, it, my point is you guys just really don't have realistic plans. And you really need to step back and take the fiscal limitations um, to heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further online comments? There are no additional comments online. All right. Uh, with that, I will bring it back to the commission for further deliberation, discussion, and a vote. I'll start with Commissioner Montesino and then Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, I'll move staff recommendation. Second. Hey, we have a motion and a second. Oh, sorry, if, Director If Morris. I may, I, I just want to, to, to be clear. We have some of the recommendations up on the screen. There are a couple of recommendations in the staff report, which are things we're already doing, but I want to make sure the commissioners know there, there's a difference, such as seek state and federal funding for coast rail trail projects. We have that uh, in the staff report. It's a recommendation in addition to obviously receiving this information and then completing segments 13 through 20 alignment as part of the zero emission passenger rail trail. So there's things that we're already doing, but I want to make sure that you are aware that the way they're enumerated in the staff report uh, on pages, you know, 30, I'm looking at 36 dash eight through nine are a little bit different than how they're stated up here, but they're the same. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Montesino and then Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, with the added direction of uh, bringing back seg segment 18 in, in the cost analysis, and also to, um, do we have to have a, a question, do we have to have a vote to um, um, move away from going to the Zulu trails on 17th, or do we assume going through beach? Um, I, I don't think it's appropriate at this time to, to um, provide that direction as stated in the staff report in order to come up with an alignment, an alternative alignment for segment 17, we need to form a committee and have a discussion about that so we can do that as we begin to move, continue to move forward with um, developing the segment 17 alignment. Um, but if you had a preference, you could state that preference, but I don't think at this time it's appropriate to No, I didn't want to do a preference, but I just wanted to know what the process was. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, we'll be looking at those and in a lot, in part, will be discussions with, with City of Watsonville staff as we start talking about how we want can develop the segments in South County and what the priorities are for bicycle and pedestrian improvements. And then we do need to establish a committee um, as part of a settlement agreement we made with the farmers in 2015 uh, to look at an alternative alignment for segment 17 so we can start to work towards that. Thank you. And and just, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate now to ask for the, for the requested agenda item to uh, bring scenario four back. 
uh, Chenta, this. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, yeah, let me, <clears throat> let me see if I'm understanding that table and what, it real, what its implications uh, uh, are. <clears throat> because <clears throat> my understanding is that any of those, any of the scenarios could result from the staff recommendation. So the staff recommendation, including uh, moving forward with uh, segments 13 and 20 as part of the rail study and then looking for other funds, is um, consistent with scenario four. Because if there's, you know, if there, if once the, those segments are developed, the commission is going to be looking by uh, approving the staff recommendation <clears throat> as in our packet. So it doesn't prevent any one of these scenarios um, from going forward. It's going to depend on how much money we, how much money they end up costing and what approaches that we take. And the, the real concern, I think, uh, is not trying to pick a scenario, but really staying focused on um, <clears throat> moving forward with the South County uh, segments. And I think that's my understanding of what the staff recommendation is, recommend, uh, is is to do is that um, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, there's two kind of things I would reply to that. I mean, one of the reasons that I requested you know more time to work with the city of Watsonville is because a lot of this information is in terms of the alignment for those seg segments, um, 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 in South County, and it's being developed right now through the concept report that Riley was presenting. So we're at that's helping to inform where the what the footprint of those trail segments would be. So that's, that is part of the work that we're doing in terms of the request for a particular scenario. I, what I'm hearing Commissioner Montesino uh, request is that we would program funding to um, segments 13 through 20. We typically program uh, funding as part of the Measure D five-year plan update in the fall, but we have taken, we do occasionally take action to um, program additional funds um, outside of that time period. Yes. <laughs> So that's going to come back to us. Yeah. I understand that's the motion. Yeah. But I. Well, the motion is to approve the staff recommendation, coming back with more information on segment 18. That, and then I heard Commissioner Montesino make a request. I must. I don't know if it was a motion. What was your comment? I don't want to put any words into your mouth. It wasn't in the course of a motion. It was okay. <clears throat> okay, so, all right, I guess... It's separate, uh, from, yeah. right. it's separate from the motion. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and if, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair, if I might <clears throat> add with response to one of uh, uh, Commissioner Schifrin's um, comments uh, about, um, you know, whether any of those potential scenarios could actually be what ends up happening. Yeah, it, it, it is true that I mean, the potential scenario depends on a, on a number of things. And, for example, we are requesting funds for um, uh, the cost overruns that we currently know of for the uh, various segments of the trail. So in, in, segment, in scenario four, I mean, we, we say, well, m maybe we'll get some of those funds. Uh, well, we expect we'll get some of those funds. It's, it's just we don't know exactly how much. And so therefore, that's why we put you know, $20 million in uh, potential uh, measure D funds for segments eight through 11, assuming that we would get uh, you know, the other 23 million from other funding sources or, or through um, uh, cost reductions based on the work that, you know, uh, RTC staff is, work, is doing with uh, Roaring Camp and with the um, uh, project sponsors to try to reduce the cost of the project. So, yes, all, all those things are variables that will impact whatever scenario the RTC might decide to use as a guide, I suppose. When do we normally program funds, though? I thought we programmed funds <clears throat> for the different segments at the time that we were requesting um, outside funding. <clears throat> it, we, it, it, we, we have worked to try to do the funding you know, 
one, once a year, <laughs> basically, to uh, be a party to you know, consolidate with, with other things that we're doing, such as our, our budget amendments and so on, et cetera, uh, and to try to you know, um, be efficient with uh, uh, staffing resources. Uh, so we typically try to do that you know, like early fall or late fall. And it's, it typically has been in the fall. Um, uh, but sometimes it is varied, depending on what's going on. And sometimes it's necessary to program funds uh, outside of that, additionally to what the RTC has already you know, programmed in the fall, as uh, Commissioner Schiffer uh, expressed, possibly to um, uh, have um, matching funds for particular grants that have a certain deadline, you know, outside of a regular process and so on. So, so yeah, I mean, traditionally we try to do all the programming in the fall, but we've done it at other times in the year as it has become necessary, or if there's a preference of the RTC to do something, you know, additional at another time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, can I, can I, yes. um, and, you know, um, I know I, um, uh, you know, um, Commissioner um, Schifrin, you know, stated like that's, that's towards our goals. Um, it's good to have goals, but I like in writing, you know. Scenario four is in writing, you know, and, and that provides a guide for my community to say, you know, at least we can get the environmental report, at least we can get a part of a, a, a trial segment, at least we got, you know, some directions instead of hopefully we don't use all the money. Hopefully, you know, there's a grant opportunities. Hopefully, you know, all these other variables. So that's my comment. Thank you. Commissioner, yes. Yeah, um, overall, I think, you know, it's great to look at it, you know, from a micro perspective, but also on a macro level, you know, the purpose of this trail, rail and trail, is to support the community as a whole. And the community includes the city of Watsonville. Um, I have the understanding that, you know, today is more to accept and understand the various scenarios um, that can take place. Um, however, I do think there's, um, it should be included in the conversation as to how we can prioritize funds now to ensure they are available, you know, at a specific time frame, rather than, as Commissioner Montesino said, waiting to see if additional funds become available and hoping we can get additional grants. Um, so I just wanted to, um, you know, support Commissioner Montesino and um, his comments, and thank you guys for your time. All right, uh, I just have a quick question as well. So I understand that we're not um, choosing segment 17A or 17B today, and then it requires a committee, et cetera. Should we go through that process and we uh, determine that we are going to move forward with 17B, can we then allocate the money saved by committing to 17B over 17A to the remainder of the uh, segments 1320, 13220? So at this point, the commission has not programmed funds to segments 13 through 20. So the, if you're talking about savings, it's really a lower cost estimate for the overall project delivery for segments 13 through 20. Okay. All right, thank you. Further comments, questions? Seeing none, okay. Uh, we do have action items. Oh, yeah, yes. One additional comment online from Ben Vernassa. Uh, he already spoke on public comment for this item, I believe. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have action items for this uh, item, however. Okay. Do we have a motion? Yes. I apologize. We do have a motion. Yeah. Do we have a second? Yes, I we second. We do. Okay, thank you. Uh, roll call vote, then. Certainly. And just to uh, clarify uh, the motion, it is the, s the staff recommendations in addition to uh, a report uh, to the commission uh, uh, that would come later. Uh, with regards to segment eight, in September with, uh, on segment 18, <coughs> what the status of segment 18 is, and then also bring an item back to the commission on the possibility of... Uh, it's not. It's, 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 no? Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. And then... Uh, well, it was, uh, it's the staff recommendations and then returning to the commission with a report on the status of segment 18. Yes. Okay. okay. Perfect. Okay, uh, Commissioner McKe uh, McKeithen. Aye. Commissioner Rotkin. Aye. Commissioner Pegler. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner uh, <coughs> Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. Yes. Commissioner Schifrin. Aye. 
Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gittleson. Aye. And Commissioner Quinn. Absolutely. That uh, passes unanimously. Great, thank you. With that, we've come to the end of our meeting. Uh, we will adjourn to our next RTC meeting scheduled on Thursday, August 1st. I anticipate that's our next reg regularly scheduled commission meeting, although I anticipate we will be having a transportation policy workshop on the 20th. Is that correct? Yes, on July 20th, and uh, excuse me, June 20th. Until then, uh, everyone take care of yourselves and take care of each other, and we're adjourned.